Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to episode 62 of In Class with Dr. Gray Carr. I'm your host, Karen Hunter, and thank you. Hi, good morning, good, good, good afternoon, Dr. Carr. Hello, Professor Hunter. How are you, my dear friend? Um, I, you know, I'm awesome, you know, as always, but I'm also, you know, concerned, and I'm glad that we have this time together just to have a laugh and sing a song. <laughs> you better riff on that Carol Burnett. <laughs> Uh, so, so today, um, a a news outlet, the uh, AP and and Algeria, Al Jazeera offices were uh, leveled. And oh, no question. I'm not. That's no surprise at all. Oh, no surprise. Okay. So, so the president and CEO of AP uh, said that we narrowly avoided a uh, terrible loss of life, and um, and and he said that this is unprecedented, and because of this, we will not know what's going on there. Which I guess is point, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. But of course, that's not true. So, okay. And Malcolm X said, "If you're uh, not careful, the newspapers will have you hating the people who are being oppressed and loving the people who are doing the oppressing." And I thought, since today we're talking about Malcolm X and others, because his born day is next week on the nineteenth, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe that's an entry point. I don't know. Yeah, no, I think it is. And and you also evoked uh, someone else. Who, and for everybody, glad to see you all. We're always glad. Everything is building. Narrative is building. People are having conversations. It's just building out. This is exactly what we need to be doing so that uh, we can free ourselves. And um, as we were having a conversation midweek and as we were you know, creating more narrative, native, narrative only content, we had a very good conversation about Hubert Henry Harrison that, you know, if you're a narrative, if you're not, sign up because that's it's really important in fact we might even invoke harrison today but anyway in the conversation you know you brought up malcolm and you also though interestingly enough brought up as a point of entry to malcolm it's his birthday uh, another human being who shares his birthday you want to say a little bit about that because that's what then sent me scurrying picking sifting like remembering learning so so yes, last year, uh, and I don't know how the name, I, maybe I was watching a documentary and, you know, there's so much about Malcolm now because of Godfather of Harlem. Uh, that brother who plays Malcolm, I think, is amazing. Oh, he nails Malcolm, doesn't he? Oh, he's brilliant. He oh. is everything. And of course, you know, we had earlier one night in, in Miami uh, and another depiction of Malcolm, which a lot of people didn't like. They thought it was soft or what have you. And we've talked about that here. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Spike did, you know, did his thing with Malcolm. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, we've had Mary Mar Marable. We've had many books, uh, mm -hmm. Les Payne's uh, book as well, um, posthumously. And and there have been so many iterations. But this captor and all of my studies never came up. And so when I saw Yuri uh, Kobayashi, is that how you pronounce that? Koshiyama. 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 Yuri Yuri Koshiyama. Yes, she married Bill Koshiyama, who was a veteran. We'll talk about that too. Yes. And there's an image of her holding his head. Mm -hmm. And I said, who is this Asian woman holding Malcolm's head? And then I had to go down my own rabbit hole to find out. And I was like, oh, she's a bad B. And we never heard of a bad shut her mouth. Bad. And she's not a, a household name. And she's not someone we talk about. Her birthday is the same exact day. And she was a warrior, a soldier in this fight for justice. And so I think we, we would be remiss to not talk about Malcolm and not talk about Yuri. So. That's, that, that's absolutely, absolutely. And, and what you did was, and we knew we were going to talk about uh, 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 Yuri Koshiyama. Uh, we knew that we were going to do that. And for those who want to read more about her, um, you know, there's a there's a ton of stuff out there. We know that our archives are mouth to ear. That's the first way humans communicate. So there are a lot of interviews uh, uh, on her. Uh, there's a nice little summary. Uh, our friends at the Zen Education Program who have been lifting her name for decades now. I mean, the work of school teachers keeping this alive and activists. They have a nice little piece on her. But you can find her on YouTube and you can find her talking about meeting Malcolm in Brooklyn. She had been arrested. Actually, she and her oldest son, 16 year old son. Uh, had been arrested in a protest in Brooklyn and Malcolm at that time was still in the nation and he had come and she tells a story about how she, uh, a daughter of immigrants from Japan, who was born and raised on the West Coast in California, whose father had been uh, detained and uh, for all intents and purposes imprisoned Billy Holiday style, you know how the feds did her, uh, chained her to that bed where she then transitioned. Well, Yuri Koshiyama's father experienced a similar indignity 
Um, this was uh, right after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And they actually, he was the only Japanese uh, person in the hospital there. Uh, she was born in San Pedro, California. And in 1940, uh, 1941, December 7th, of course, and they started rounding up Japanese folk and her father was ill. He was, he was hospitalized and they put a sheet around him and put prisoner of war on the damn sheet. Um, he died. He made transition shortly thereafter. Uh, little, uh, less than two years later, 1943, Franklin Roosevelt, Frank FDR, signed Executive Order 9066, the infamous Executive Order 9066, which created the concentration camps in this country. Another iteration of settler colonial concentration camps. If you go back to everything from reservations to uh, the, the death camps they had us on that you call plantations because it sounds easier on the ear. But uh, these direct concentration camps is where uh, Yuri Koshiyama and her siblings, her family spent uh, two years in those camps. They shipped them to a place called Jerome, Arkansas. And they were in those camps. And uh, for those of, you, those of you who have at least heard the name of the famous Supreme Court case, um, the Japanese internment case, then, you know, the Korematsu case, uh, Fred Korematsu, and uh, which basically said, hey, it's wartime. All bets are off. You do what you want. And uh, now you talking about Japanese Americans, one of which the Nisei, I think, is as they call them in Japanese. These are uh, folks whose people had immigrated to the United States from Japan, but they were born in the United States. And until they uh, attack um, birthright citizenship, which they are very much trying to do, shout out to all the white nationalists, you're going to lose. But, you know, I want you to try with your whole little bird chest because that's what's going to uh, accelerate what's eventually going to have to happen. We'll come back to Malcolm X in a minute, the ballot of the bullet. But um, not that it's going to come to bullets, but it's going to have to be resolved because now you've dropped all pretenses of logic, all pretenses of fact. Uh, now you're rewrite, trying to rewrite history, saying that uh, the, 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 uh, uh, January 6th here at the United States Capitol, that was uh, no different than a regular tour day. Uh, it's really remarkable. Um, shout out to Marjorie Taylor Greene. Call yourself going to uh, talk, talk uh, crap to uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio Cortez shouting through the mail slide at her door. You must not, you must forgot she's from the Bronx. But anyway, I want y'all to say it all with your bird chests. But at any rate, um, the Koshiyamas and many other uh, Japanese uh, Americans were interred there after the, after those two years. Um, she married actually Anise. Uh, she married a Japanese American brother by the name of Bill Koshiyama. Um, Bill Kochiyama was a veteran of the United States military. He fought in World War II, saying so no problem drafting as they drafted people of African descent, as they drafted the Spanish speaking community, as they drafted uh, or, or conscripted after drafting uh, First Nations folk like the Navajo code talkers. And in this case, an all Japanese American unit in the United States military, the 442nd combat unit. This man is a combat veteran. So she married him and, uh, they moved to New York. Um, they moved to New York eventually, and that's where she met Malcolm, in fact. Uh, Yuri Koshiyama, fascinating sister, always in the street, always in protest, always in international solidarity with oppressed peoples. And she says, you know, when I met Malcolm, um, this was uh, in October 1963. They were in Brooklyn. She had been arrested. They were in the courtroom. Uh, she was one of very few non-Black folk in this protest that was going on and here come into the courtroom called Malcolm X and she's uh, named uh, here comes Malcolm. And of course, Malcolm's still with the nation at that time. And she sees him and she says, man, I really admired him. I wanted to shake his hand, but all the black people, all the people in the courtroom, they loved him too. So they all surged toward him. He's shaking hands with, and she said, she said, okay, I'm not, should I go over there? I'm Japanese. I'm not, you know, I'm Asian. I'm not really, you know, black, but I'm with, you know, you know what? I just let them have a moment. I don't know. And then she said, but if he looks up and looks over here at me, I'm going to try to get his attention. <laughs> and she said he looked up in her direction. At, at some point, she said, oh, she, 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 she hailed him. And he looked up and she said, uh, can I shake your hand? And he said, why you want to shake my hand? And she was like, oh, my God, what am I going to say? And she 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 said uh, after a little bit of back and forth that I want to shake your hand because uh, I really greatly admire. In fact, she said, I, I admire you. And he said, why you admire me? He said, well, I admire you because you are organizing and giving direction to your people. And then not only did they shake hands, he came to her with that smile, as uh, Osley Davis says in Malcolm, in, in the famous eulogy he delivered. Did Brother Malcolm ever smile at you? 
Did you ever hear him say a hateful thing? In other words, Ozzy set him straight about Malcolm and everyone who knew him said that, you know, it was that smile that really, really kind of. Uh, and, and so for about a year and a half, they knew each other. She was a, a member of the Organization of Afro-American Unity, which we'll talk about. That was the organization. Remember, Malcolm leaves the nation that night, that year of 1964, the last full year of his life is just a remarkable year. It has been narrated by the social structure and unfortunately way too many of us kind of following along in a very simple and simple minded narrative that 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 retreats to the mean of American exceptionalism. Oh, Malcolm, uh, you know, had a had a had an epiphany when he went to Mecca and he saw the, the white people who were Muslims and he realized that white people weren't devils. Malcolm had gone to Mecca in Malcolm going to Saudi Arabia in 1959. Um, the the reason it is attested by those who knew him and those who were close to him that he did not make his Hajj then, which was, you know, in the attempts of the day to arrange a Hajj. He didn't want to go before the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He wanted because he was a member of the Nation of Islam. He felt like, you know, I'm over here. I'm a representative of the NOI and I, I don't want to go before the Honorable Elijah Muhammad goes. So he had an opportunity to go before. And so that means he saw nine black Muslims. Come on, y'all. Think just a little bit, you know, as, as Aretha would say, you better think. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, but that in that narrative that is, is an attempt to frame, it's like, oh, now he sees, oh, yeah, we can get beyond race and this. And that. But Malcolm never, never, never surrendered the fact that in this country, in this settler colony that we call the United States of America, and in fact, in the in the global north, so to speak, in England and France, where he was denied entry in that last year, uh, actually, no, yeah, last year, he would say, as long as there is the need for me to be referred to as Malcolm X in this country and in the world, I will be referred to as Malcolm X in this context, even though his Muslim name, uh, El Hajj Malik El Shabazz, because he had made the Hajj. So you get that Hajj name, El Hajj, I've, I've made the Hajj, uh, Malik El, Sh El Shabazz. And it's interestingly enough, because Shabazz, of course, if you, those of you who know something about the Nation of Islam, you know, it's a very important name and the so-called lost tribe of Shabazz, so to speak. We'll talk a little bit about Islam as well. But Malcolm, um, politically, Malcolm X, he never changed that name. That was the name his parents gave him, Malcolm. And that was the name that he uh, surrendered that little, uh, his surname. He, he took on that X. I don't know what my name was. And he was consistent with that. So politically, he formed the Organization of Afro-American Unity, the OAU, uh, the Organization of Afro-American Unity, almost as a little bit of a riff on the organization of, oh, no, I got a book in my hand that will handle that. I'll come to in a second. If you want to read about the organization of Afro-American Unity, you can actually look at their statement of basic aims and objectives there. This is the appendix of a book I'm going to show you the rest of in a minute as I tie it to Yuri Koshiyama, who we really haven't left. She was a member of the OAAU, the political formation, even as he continued to pursue what we would call in our Africana studies framework, Remember those categories, social structure, who are Africans to other people, governance structure, who are Africans to each other, and then ways of knowing, what ways of perceiving and existing in the world and explaining reality of African people either created or adapted to kind of navigate this reality we're in. In that ways of knowing category, we would probably look at the philosophy that began to emerge in the other organization he started to continue his religious practice. Uh, and the reason we call it ways of knowing in that not religion or politics or ideology is because ways of knowing is just how we use our minds to organize reality. How do we think that's politics? Sometimes, sometimes it's what we call religion, these kind of things. And that organization that he formed to advance his kind of spiritual practice and those who wanted to join him was called the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. Uh, a brother still, well, there, are, there are a number of people around. Well, uh, en enough people around who were involved in that work. And one brother, I think of immediately as we talked about, we talked and we talked about it last week, uh, the whole idea that um, we are our ancestors. And I remember, I think I mentioned our brother, Baba James Small out of South Carolina, who has spent his adult life in most of his adult life in New York. Uh, James Small was a member. He was an imam, in fact, in the Muslim Mosque Incorporated and a member of OAAU. And he uh, and the uh, folk, not only from the tri-state area there in the Northeast the United States, but folk from all over the country who make the trip, on the 19th of May, they go to the grave of uh, El Haj uh, Malik uh, Shabazz and uh, Sister Betty, Betty Shabazz, uh, Bahia uh, Shabazz, 
uh, there in New York. And in fact, that trip was started by, among others, Yuri Koshiyama. Mm -hmm. Yuri Koshiyama was there along with some other folks. I didn't know uh, uh, Yuri Koshiyama. I did know Muriel Feelings quite well. She taught, uh, she was at Tony University for a number of years, um, heading the Pan-African Studies Community Education Program. Uh, her husband, you all may be familiar with her husband, at, at one time husband, Tom Feelings, uh, they did children's books. Jambo means hello, and uh, being probably the most famous one, but Sister Muriel was there the day that Malcolm was assassinated. Uh, two more brothers who I know, well, knew and know, and I'm gonna talk about them now and talk about them in the context of this photograph. One who lives not too far down the street here, in fact, um, uh, the great brother, A. Peter, a. Peter Bailey, in fact, a. Peter, a. Peter Bailey is working on a book on Malcolm's international travel and, me and the meaning of Malcolm's international context. And this is actually a short memoir that he published, uh, A. Peter Bailey, Witnessing Brother Malcolm X, the master teacher. We call him a master teacher. In fact, uh, there, there's Peter with those glasses on with Malcolm next to him. Uh, very good brother. Um, he, uh, in fact, I'm going to read you a Malcolm quote and, and then finish up with Sister Yuri. This is from something that was never published until Peter Bailey put it in this book. You see, Peter Bailey was the editor of the OAAU newsletter, the Unity newsletter, which eventually did publish. And he was there in the ballroom that day. And uh, Malcolm was assassinated on February 20th, 1965. Um, on the 20th, I'm sorry, February 21st, February 21st. On the 20th of February, he gave Peter Bailey, one of his young lieutenants, this article. And here's a quote from it. Malcolm says, if an American black man works as a butler in the home of a poor white man, the weak economic position of the boss will reflect itself in the overall appearance of the black butler. If boss certainly becomes wealthy, suddenly becomes wealthy, wealthy naturally, the butler will also make more money, become more wealthy too, wear better clothes, eat better food, perhaps house his own family in a better community and his children may even have access to better school facilities. A casual observer will think this black butler has made great material progress, but has he? <laughs> his position hasn't really changed. He's still a servant. The white man is still his boss. That's from an article that Malcolm had written. So for people saying Malcolm changed and Malcolm now understood that race wasn't the point. Hey, hey, all those lips, take a little needle and sew them. <laughs> and then get the wax out of your ears or better yet, the, 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 the stigma out of your eyes and start reading and start listening because Malcolm was very clear on the politics as was uh, Yuri Koshiyama and uh, I didn't mention one other thing I want to mention right quick um, very interesting this was February 1965 Malcolm was assassinated the day after that and then I'll come back to Peter Bailey and uh, his friend Earl Grant who I also knew who's an ancestor made transition a couple of years ago out in LA which is where I met him many years ago but, but we'll come to that in a second, because that ties directly to Yuri Koshiyama. And this also ties directly to Yuri Koshiyama, as I'm going to say, as I said, he, he met her in that October um, in 1963. By the following year, they were very close. He had moved. Uh, she had moved. They, she had moved a few years before she and her husband Bill and their children to Harlem. Uh, they hosted. Uh, political organizing meetings and, and 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 all kind of meetings at their house, at their home, their apartment. And in June 1964, there were three writers and several what they call uh, hiba, uh, hibakusha, uh, which uh, I guess I don't speak Japanese. So those of you who do uh, could translate that. Uh, it is translated according to scholars who write. And I would encourage you to get uh, Vincent Ntandi's book, African-Americans and the Bomb. Vincent Ntandi with an I, I-N-T-O-N-D-I. -I. Uh, it's a very good book published a couple of years ago. It talks about the fact that in June 1964, uh, these atom bomb survivors, which is what they say that translates into, uh, met uh, a number of atom bomb survivors from Hiroshima, from Nagasaki, and these several writers were hosted at the apartment of the Koshiyamas to meet with folk from the Harlem community in the New York, greater New York area, black folk who were against the bomb and who spoke Malcolm Malcolm X said, you all were victims of the atomic bomb. As you know, we are the victims of a bomb here called racism. 
Mm. And our plot and our and our bond is the same. And in fact, this is before Martin King spoke out against the war in Vietnam. It's 1964. Malcolm, of course, wasn't physically alive when he spoke uh, a year before he was assassinated. Uh, of course, he was assassinated April 4th, 1968 on the 4th of April, 1967, Riverside Church. Why I opposed the war in Vietnam. The great Vincent Harding talks about that a lot, as we've talked about. If you go to narrative, you can trace all that. We talked about it fairly extensively, relatively speaking. But this is almost three years before, two and a half years before, when Malcolm in the living room of Yuri Koshiyama tells these Japanese bomb survivors and the assembled Harlem community in that little apartment cramped up in there that our bomb is racism, your bomb is the A-bomb, and they all come from the same source, imperialism. They all come from the same source. And we must now be in solidarity against that source and against what they do. And that means that if this country because it's an if at this point, remember this is June, 1964, Kennedy's dead, Johnson is escalating, but those advisors have been in Vietnam now for years. In fact, the first group to come out against the war in Vietnam was the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, which we're gonna tie into in a minute in terms of this bombing, what happened with Al Jazeera, uh, as you just reported to us, uh, Sister Karen, and AP. Um, he said, if they go into Vietnam, we should not go. Nobody non-white should go and black people shouldn't go. We in solidarity with y'all. You shouldn't get taught up in it because this is just that same white expansion, that same imperialism that we are all resisting. And I think that's what got well, I, I say I think. Let me take the let me take that first person singular out of there. It's pretty, it's very clear that this is one of the contributing factors, if not the contributing factor to the death of Malcolm X, was this internationalism, this anti-oppression connection. And Yuri Koshiyama hosted that meeting. Now. Let me ask you a question. Yes, ma'am. You know, because as you're talking and, and these things are being thrown together, I see a couple of things. Now that we know better, we must do better. There's a willful erasure of certain people in history. You know, we talked uh, this week, which uh, will appear in narrative about Hubert Harrison, completely erased. Basically. Completely erased. Uh, and, and era erased, let me just write quick. Erased in a way, don't go anywhere. Erased in, erased in a way that even when we see breadcrumbs to them, we don't recognize them. Here's something that I'm just telling y'all now, y'all go to narrative because I ain't going to talk about nothing we talked about in narrative, but I thought about it after we finished. Harrison, who's very poor, you know who paid for his funeral? <laughs> Cat named Casper Holstein, who was like one of the numbers kings in Harlem. This is Bumpy Johnson, pre-Bumpy, and guess, and if you saw Boardwalk Empire, Casper Holstein, who was also a Garveyite, that's how he gets into the thing, Casper Holstein is the remixed character whose gloss is the one that Jeffrey Wright plays in Boardwalk Empire. So I'm just saying it to make your point. Because we don't know Hubert Harrison, we don't even know when we see somebody, that's the guy to pay for the funeral. Please continue though, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, but I'm like imagining this, this like Hollywood is, you know, remixing stories and telling them wrong. No but then, I mean, this is a story that Yuri in her living room and the connection to the bomb and these and these people, the goal is to keep us from talking to one another, from seeing the thread that binds us. And, you know, I think about Muhammad Ali losing his career, Martin Luther King talking about the war. People want to say, oh, it was the poor people. Mm, it was that war talk. And now you just brought up Malcolm X. How much oh, do you talk about? Who, you, know who, you know who the King family first came out against the bomb? Wasn't Martin. Coretta. As an undergraduate at Oberlin College, Coretta Scott King traveled to Geneva <laughs> for anti-war rally of women. I'm just saying. So in that book, in, in Tiny's book, he traces how this thing goes back when they dropped the bomb. Du Bois, Mary McLeod Bethune, everybody. Coretta Scott King is an undergrad. They all came out against the bomb. And Malcolm said, I am for peace. So y'all stop talking about Malcolm was a prophet of violence. That's why he got killed. He's literally there saying we must have peace. This is war and it's killing. But anyway, please go ahead. I no, no. So I mean, so I was I was contemplating today because I, you know, as I was disturbed at what's happening uh over in the Gaza Strip with 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 Israel, and you know, people are afraid to talk about it, you know, and we have to talk about it, and we have to talk about it unafraid, but we also have to remember the history and those of us who are in this space. Um Gird your loins and let's get busy because we have to have these conversations. That's right. So that's no, 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 no. You're absolutely right. And see, there's a way to talk about it without 
moving immediately to the underlying passions. And that's what we are contributing to. We're not the first. We're not the only. We're just another lane where we can do this. And we think that by us listening to as many other voices, by us constantly thinking through this work, that we can contribute something of value. And as you always say, sis, we want to try to pour this clean glass of water. And when we start talking about the, the Palestinian uh, plight, and it is a plight, we start talking about the state of Israel, and it is a state, it is a country. We're talking about something that isn't as simple as good versus bad, isn't as simple as that. And some, some, in some ways, it absolutely is. Anytime you start talking about three dozen or more at this point, and the tally continues to mount children who are victims of bombs, yeah, it's a false equivalency to talk about rockets versus missiles. Okay, we're gonna, but, but we're not gonna, we're not, we're just gonna pause here because, and, and and remind us that there's a way for us to think through this so that we can see the rhythms, see the patterns, and so that we can recover. You know what we always talk about: the momentum of memory. This isn't our first time here, and we're going to use Malcolm to do it. So I'll tie, I'll tie it with our sister, uh, the ancestor Yuri Koshiyama, who made transition I think in 2014, so fairly recently. Uh, and there are a number of, and I use the 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 the, the, uh, the label very loosely because it really doesn't tell you much as we know. But I'll say Asian. I mean, she used it as well. But I mean, it's like the English language. We take the cobbled thing we have and try to make us in uh, Guiwatiango would say something torn and new. Uh, she is 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 one of the major figures. And it's interesting that we think about the women. I mean, there are people like Fred Ho and other another uh, H.O. Fred Ho, another complicated figure that we can talk about. But I think about, of course, uh, Grace Lee Boggs. Um, who um, Chinese American uh, spent most of her life and it was a very long life, lived almost 100 years old in uh, Detroit. Her husband, Jimmy Boggs at Alabama, black dude, uh, connected to Malcolm X. In fact, if you want to read about them, you should read her own. She wrote her own uh, testimony before she made transition. There's a great film by her uh, about her that is actually made by a young Chinese filmmaker whose name was Grace Lee. And she wanted to know who is this other Grace Lee? Because Lee, of course, very famous. And she found Grace Lee Boggs, and, and, and Grace Lee Boggs let her shadow her for a long time. She would go, go to Detroit, sit, and she would go to meetings with her. I mean, she worked almost literally to the day she made transition. But there's another um, interesting book with a lot of good uh, source material in it by Stephen Ward called In Love and Struggle, The Revolutionary Lives of James and Grace Lee Boggs, because they were in Detroit. And of course, Malcolm, born in Omaha, Nebraska, um, Oh, oh, that reminds me. Boy, I hope I brought that little book in here. If I didn't, I'm going to be very sad because uh, we want to talk about Betty, too. Of course, Betty Shabazz, Betty, his former Betty Saunders coming out of uh, uh, the South, uh, went to Tuskegee nursing, uh, graduate nurse by training, of course. And you see, in fact, it was so funny. Remember when uh, Spike Lee's movie came out and they were doing the junkets and this kind of thing. And Betty Shabazz made this comment. She said, when I saw Angela Bassett play me, I thought to myself, I wish I could have been who you portrayed. <laughs> anyway, but understand how, how much of a G uh, Betty Shabazz was uh, Kathy Hughes, of course, the, the, the great Kathy Hughes, the media, uh, the media mogul. Yes. Uh, Kathy Hughes knew her well. In fact, Kathy Hughes's father was an accountant in the Nation of Islam. And when Kathy Hughes tells the story, that's why I said, I wish I, they did a little book on sisters. Oh, ha, ha, ha. yes. Perfect. <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. Betty Shabazz, a sister, sister friend's tribute in words and pictures uh, put together. And since I'm talking about it very quickly, I'll mention there's only been one book length treatment of her life. Uh, she didn't leave a memoir, of course. Uh, unfortunate accident involving her grandson, Malcolm, uh, who uh, set a fire in, in her place in New York. And she suffered burns away to percent of her body and made transition. Um, it's really sad because Malcolm, young Malcolm, I met him one time, um, you know, he had his own challenges. He had been incarcerated. Fascinating story he used to tell, though. He said, you know, when I, they, they, they put me in jail and he was a kid, you know, uh, and barely his twenties when he made transition, but he in his twenties, rather, he said, you know, when I, when I got put in, when I was in jail and they, and the people, and the prisoners found out I was Malcolm X's grandson. I was treated like royalty <laughs> you know what I'm saying? because the number one book in prison is the autobiography of Malcolm. You Malcolm. Okay. Nobody touch him. Nobody spitting his food. I don't see no beef. 
<laughs> we got to take care of this one. And you need to get out of here because, you know, your grandpa, man. I mean, but we're going we're gonna to talk about all that. Uh, but at, at any rate, she didn't get a chance to leave a testament. This woman who went on and got a doctorate, worked for many years at Mega Everest. Whenever y'all go to Brooklyn and go to Mega Everest, the name Betty Shabazz still rings powerfully there. Education administrator connected to so many different things. And uh, this book, uh, this is Russell Rick, Rick, Rickford's book. Russell Rickford's book, uh, Betty Shabazz, Merle Evers Williams, you see wrote the foreword there. It's called Betty Shabazz, A Remarkable Story of Survival and Faith Before and After Malcolm X. I mean, I'm looking forward to perhaps one of the daughters continue to write and, and put together a book. Ilyasha wrote a book, Growing Up X, which I have back there. I'll get to that in a second. But I'm mentioning Betty Shabazz in this moment because, as I said, Kathy Hughes tells a great story in this book. It's basically tributes. This is a great picture of Betty Shabazz as well, too. See, my other stuff is in storage. All my Ebony magazines. Ebony had this cover with her with, oh, man, right after the, uh, the, uh, the near the after the assassination. Of course, there's a famous, if you see, uh, uh, what is it called? Um, Gary 1972, I think is the name of the film. I'd have to go back and look at it. I, I don't remember when I said, but it, maybe it's nation time. It might be it's nation time. Anyway, that was the Gary Political Convention of 1972. Uh, you see Betty Shabazz sitting next to Coretta Scott King as they sat there and talked on the stage at the opening of that convention to create a black political party and black political formations. Um, but I, I mention this because you see one of the people that was interviewed, and this is back when she was just Radio One before TV One and all of it, right? And uh, between WOL and, and, and Radio One, she and Dewey Hughes. Uh, it's interesting, she was um, at this time the general manager of WHUR, Howard University Radio. A lot of people didn't know that. Um, and she said, the first time I met her, oh, here it is. Let me just read what Kathy Hughes says. A lot of people were not aware that Betty was the second largest stockholder in inner city broadcasting. Mm. Remember Percy Sutton was lawyer for Malcolm <laughs> there, right? I was a young woman in radio 25 years ago when I managed my first station and Betty informed me that she was the quiet second largest stockholder in inner city. This book was published in 1998. So I guess it's what, 45, 46, 47, 48 years ago, 50, almost 50 years ago. I was very amazed. I was at an affair and I walked up and introduced myself to her and I told her I was the general manager of the HURFM. She said to me, you and I need to talk. Usually when you approach individuals like Dr. Betty Shabazz at social gatherings, it's rare that any of them say we need to talk, particularly to a young person. And we're talking over 20 years ago. They rarely say, let's get together. They're usually trying to avoid. So Kathy Hughes goes on to say, I thought she was just making talk and I'd see her again some point down. Then she says, I, I get a call. <laughs> Uh, from her people, uh, Dr. Shabazz said, y'all need to talk. And she said, oh, oh, you were serious. So that, that second talk, she says, my father had been an accountant for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Nation of Islam. He worked for John Ali, who was the business manager for the NOI. John Ali introduced my father, William A. Woods, to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He recommended the Nation of Islam do business with my father's accounting firm, Woods Accounting Service, Black Businesses. She said, there were numerous occasions when I would bump into both Malcolm and Lewis, the Honorable Lewis Farrakhan. Why? Kathy Hughes, Professor Hunter, as a little girl working for her father, running errands, was sent over to Elijah Muhammad's office to take paperwork. And she said, outside of Honorable Elijah Muhammad's office, there was a long bench where people would wait to see him. On more than a few occasions, I would come tearing down the hallway with papers that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad needed to sign, and I would be zoomed right past Malcolm and Louis Farrakhan, sitting there waiting to converse with him. I want you to tell y'all something. So y'all think y'all understand. That's why we had to create an Africana studies methodology, because the social structure tries to frame all our narratives. And you, with that noise in your ear, you can never ask the question, who are we to each other? So when you see a black woman in front of a black media, uh, a black media entity that is controlled by her, that is owned by us, whether it be TV one, radio one or narrative, you understand that that comes from somewhere. These people don't just drop out of the sky. In this case, <laughs> you have somebody who, you know, but I suspect that more than one or two people never knew what I just said. Now, we ain't going to get into her mother who just made transition, unfortunately, during COVID. Yeah. Almost hundred years, who was a member of the International Sweethearts of Rhythm, or her grandfather, Lawrence Jones, who was the founder of Piney Woods, which is the black owned, black controlled, no state of government aid boarding school in Mississippi. That's who Kathy Hughes is. But, but, we, but anyway, I was talking about the Betty Shabazz mix right here. But so 
to, to finish up, when we think about then this question of, of Yuri Koshiyama, a Grace Lee Boggs, a Kathy Hughes, these women, Betty Shabazz, we think about how Malcolm is part of a larger network of people, of black people and black meaning making and non-black people who connect to and commit to that struggle. When you see a Yuri Koshiyama that day in February, February 21st, 1965, when you see her cradling the head of Malcolm after he has been killed on the stage of the Audubon Ballroom, we understand that she was not only a witness to that, she's not only telling him as you can go online and see her tell the story, you know, Malcolm, don't go, please, you gotta, you gotta pull through. He's already dying there. When you see that picture, what you don't see is who took that picture. Peter Bailey is in that room, my friend Peter Bailey. Who took that picture was the other brother I just mentioned who made transition in L.A. a couple of years ago. The great Earl Grant, mathematician by training, photographer. That picture was in Time magazine. With, with them headlines, violence kills the violent profit of violence or some BS like that. Social structure business, as you know. But the photograph was Earl Grant. Let me tell you who Earl Grant is, because remember that book I showed y'all with the, the, the program of the Organization of Afro-American Unity that Malcolm was going to announce that day in the same book that I'm showing you now. This is uh, his his contribution. Earl Grant's leads off part two of this book, Malcolm X at Close Range, Personal Views, The Last Days of Malcolm X, Brother Earl Grant. Earl Grant is, was, the, is the co-editor of the book that I encourage. And there, there are so many Malcolm books. I pulled a fraction of them. I've showed you a few. There was a lot. There's a lot more I could show y'all. Maybe we'll talk about them as I look at the clock. We're going to kind of keep this tight. Um, but there are certain ones that kind of emerge and I hope that people, as you're thinking through this and as everybody's watching, y'all send an adorable picture on social media, this little girl watching us. And I'm telling you, that's the kind of thing that make me say, you know what? We just, I got to work harder because the children are listening. That means you gotta, we gotta, you know, we know from back last year, we saw that we see that momentum, but, um, I hope as you listen and thinking through things and begin to participate and have those conversations and narrative, you'll also listen to things that I won't say first or second, but we'll come to that. So when you talk about books on Malcolm, one of the best books is also one of the earliest books. Uh, in 1969, four years after Malcolm was assassinated, there were, let me see if I can look around here, because there's so many of them. I just stacked them different places. There were a couple of books that came out. For those of you who are artists, this is the great Dudley Randall out of Detroit and Chicago's Margaret Burroughs. She and her husband, of course, founded the DuSable Museum. Shout out to my friend Kim Delaney, Dr. Delaney, who directs education programs over there. There's a book called From Malcolm, Poems on the Life and Death of Malcolm X, edited by Dudley Randall and Margaret Burroughs. It's one of the first books, Broadside Press, Black Press. Sonia Sanchez got a poem in here that'll take, well, all of them. I mean, you got Ozzie Davis wrote the preface. Gwendolyn Brooks has a piece in here. Malcolm, Mari Evans, Ted Jones, all these people come out of the Black Arts Movement. Clarence Major, Larry Neal, Robert Hayden, the old head. Everybody got a piece in here. Etheridge Knight, of course. I mean, I, I could go on, but I won't. Um, in fact, uh, wow. I'm looking for Baraka. He had a, yeah, a poem for Black Hearts. But uh, Sonia Sanchez is, you know what? Just get this. Yeah, we're going to go. 1969. Here's the book. Earl Grant, who took that picture of Malcolm dying with Yuri Koshiyama cradling his head. Peter Bailey, the editor of the OAAU newsletter, who went on to carry the bloodstained banner. And that's a whole nother story. I'm so glad every time, you know, I, I talk to, uh, to, uh, to him, to Baba Peter. I'm like, man, I'm glad you're a journalist. You write. He wrote for Negro Digest, Black World. He worked for Johnny Johnson for years. He helped set up the Ebony Fashion Fair. He traveled all over the world. He uh, did the Black Theater issue every year for for uh, for Black World, Negro Digest. I mean, I mean, among so many, 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 many other things, a, a, a Peter Bailey. But he said we have to do something in tribute to our brother because these are young guys, young women and men. So they put together this book 
they couldn't get a publisher. So who do they go to? They go to John Henry Clark, who has some in with some of the publishing houses, and Clark gets it published. This is the book, Malcolm X, The Man and His Times, 1969, edited by John Henry Clark, 21 Black Writers. It is dedicated to the children and to Sister Betty. Mm -hmm. If you know the history, y'all know that, because see what Hollywood does, and this isn't a dig at, 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 at Spike. You want to talk about the politics around what happened? You can get the book that, uh, and uh, you knew Ralph Wiley, didn't you? Uh, I think I asked you that before. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Say, say it again. Go ahead. No, I said absolutely. Yes, yeah, sports. Yes, absolutely. Oh, of course. That's your, right. No question. Your, your close comrade, right? Y'all up there tearing the thing up. I think about, you know, it's interesting, isn't it, uh, Prof? So many of our most insightful writers in terms of black journalists, seem to come out of sports. Yeah. You, Ralph Wiley, Bill Roden, what is that about? It's the only place you can be free and they're not checking for you because of sports, right? So so you get to uh, examine, it's not the same. You know, it's like, I was told early on that the real journalism, and I would never forget this because it was an earthquake one of the first years I was at the Daily News during this the uh, World Series out in, in, in uh, California. Oh, I remember that, yeah. And I remember watching the newsroom in a tizzy and they were sending all of these journalists out there. And I said, wait, but Madden's there, you know, Lupica's there and you got all of these heavy hitting sport. And they were, they were like, no, those aren't real journalists. And I was what? like, oh, right. So, hmm, that was a mistake. Anyway, uh, so I, I recognize, I mean, you think about all, Brian Burwell and Rob Parker, wh who were there when I when I first got there, brothers. Stephen A, you know, you, you after I got there. And and there's wait, wait, I'm missing something. I mean, I know this kind of current. Where who were the women? They weren't, I was the first black woman uh in the sports park. I just want you to say that and everybody oh. to hear that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. <laughs> um, yeah, no, but you you think about even on TV, you know, from Sterling to you know, even Charles and Shaq and Kit, you know, and even now Candace Parker, there is an agency in sports because the, the the you you depend on these people to get those stories in a locker room that no one else can get number one you know we can navigate these spaces in a way no one else can and we have a license and 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 a little bit more latitude to be able to speak freely than folk on the news side where the money is supposedly made and where the bosses are paying close attention to every single word because that represents the ideology and the power but the pendulum has shifted I was just telling somebody the other day, um, mm -hmm. the pendulum has shifted and not everyone is caught up to where the pendulum is right now. <laughs> and uh, which which makes it good. to well, well, Say some more about that. When you say the pendulum has shifted, what, what do you mean? There there is a seismic shift right now in power and I'm watching it. Uh, you know, things happen incrementally. Evolution happens over time. But what when do you know you're at the point of the evolve? When do you know that you're at that point? Right. <sighs> So I feel like we're in a space right now where things have evolved to a point where we are in it as we speak. And I'm talking about power, media, money. And if you think about how things are, you know, people are making stands now and folks are having to catch up or having to shift and move around. I'm even watching, you know, we think Ellen's leaving and it, they're going to you know, put Tiffany Haddish in that spot they're talking about, you know. And at every turn, even if you look at all of the TV shows and the movies, I just watched a movie last night with Angelina Jolie with a black woman who basically saves a day. And, you know, it's one of the other stars. This is a blockbuster. Um, and, and now we're also intolerant of people who are black not living up to the things that they're supposed to be doing. We're no longer happy just to have a black, black face in the space, right? You got to be about something. And we're demanding things and getting them. And I think, you know, at some point it's like a, a person that loses a lot of weight and they, they always think of themselves as fat, even if they're not. We have power. We got to step into it and realize that we are in a space right now where we can get some things done. So, yeah, That's right. I'll, I'll pop out. No, don't. I mean, this is this is so important. We are in a space where we can leverage that power if. We are up to the task. Every generation, as is the, the very famous France Fanon quote, every generation at a relative obscurity must fulfill its mission. I'm sorry, must identify its mission, fulfill it or betray it. And 
we are at another, as you would say, you said often inflection point. But can we, first of all, we have to identify who we are. Facts. You know what I'm saying? So you're right. There is a sense that it has to be black now. You can, it's not enough to see a black person. What's coming out of your mouth? That or, is or out of you. You know, yesterday I had, you know, I talked to Kathy Hughes this week. So it was interesting. You know wait, wait a minute. Let me just yeah, so that. we we interviewed Kathy Hughes. His ancestors and be tripping. <laughs> what? I was like, she talked about a grandmother and she's doing this yes. whole thing honor. And I was like, this is, you know, we've had conversations in the past because she's a Taurus born two days before me. And, that? you know, I, I see her as a parallel to the things that I want to do. So when you're talking, I'm like, I know all of this and it, and it is absolutely in line with everything. But even she had to make certain concessions. You know, uh, and and and, rel and found herself relegated to a space that she didn't deserve to be in because has she been doing the things she was doing then? Now, right? Come on. Well, that's so, that's the challenge, right? So as you're talking about Malcolm, shot, you know, killed for all of the things. Martin shot and killed for the things, you know, for for setting the table for the change. Fred Hampton, which we talked about here. I'm like, these, those aren't those days. And the fear that people have about speaking out, if we collectively all are on the same page in terms of what needs to happen next, you can't kill all of us. You no, cannot. And, the, and never could. But, but, but there is, you know, they shook us into like, oh, oh we can't talk about that because you're going to get, going to get, you know, they're going to come and get you and get. So I just feel like, you know, those times of, have passed and I and I, I pray and I and I'm, I'm pretty sure that we're in a space now where what needs to be said is going to be said <laughs> and what needs to happen next is going to get done and I think there's so many people who are ready to work and they were just waiting for, for a tap on the shoulder for somebody to put the toe in the water for the dove to be let out and come back mm -hmm. let you know okay yes or not come back the dove got out and is not coming back okay the water has receded Mm. And it's time now, you know, we built this thing, we built the art, <laughs> the flood came. Yes, yes. And now and now it's time. So That's a metaphor. That's but, a yes. Metaphor. So so you know, as you're talking about Malcolm today, I, I I'm I'm so grateful because you know the things that he witnessed and the things that he saw. And again, I just had this conversation this week with my team. I was like, every movement is from within, even Jesus. Is from within, so we got we got to gather up the people who are not about this life, because that's where we're gonna have the pain. That's where it's gonna that's where we're gonna be betrayed, and that's where things are gonna get upended. So we have to be careful about you know all of that and test people. Are you really you know about this? You got a platform. What you doing with it? What are you doing uh, with it? Yeah, I had a woman on um uh <laughs> the slutty vegan yesterday, and oh, yeah, she's in Georgia. She she's not from this in Baltimore. Yeah. From here. She's in Atlanta and she talked about not just doing her vegan thing, but helping other businesses. Yeah, she's about that life. No question. Yeah, I mean, uh, she, she paid off the debt of, of some graduates from Clark where she she was Miss, you know, Clark Atlanta. Sure 2000, what was it, 2008. And and so she said for her, it's not enough to have a business. I've got to magnify this and I got to make sure that the people around me are good. And if that's not your your do north for anything. That's right. I got, I got this media platform. It's not enough for me to just, oh, I'm popular. I got a million followers. But what are you doing with it? And how is it freeing us? Mm -hmm. If you're not doing that, then we need to say it. And we need to talk about it. We need to stop following them. All right. I'm done. We, no, 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 no. And we need to protect you. We need to protect this space. I mean, to take again, I mean, one of those. There, there, I mean, maybe. Uh -oh. No, keep them. going. I, I'm, maybe, I'm, I'm, maybe there's another. There, there's a bunch of other people out there who are doing this work. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. But yeah, we, we everybody I often, you know, I use this scripture all the time. You know, a tree by the fruit that it bears. Right. Right. Check the fruit of everybody that you support. That's right. The fruit. What are they producing? What are they reproducing? And how does it free us? That's and right. if, you, if you can examine that and you come back empty. Keep it pushing to the next thing that, you know, because that that really everyone has to be held accountable in this space at this time. That's right. And so, we have that power. Yes. We have that power. That's part of it. I mean, and understand that we're not fighting. And you would know the scripture better than that. Whereas our war is not against flesh and blood, it's against principalities. Yes. That's that social structure. Yes. In other words, we're not fighting. Uh, we're not fighting individuals. We're fighting a system. And if you you have to pay very close attention to what that system will and will not tolerate, will and will not accommodate, 
when you have people literally trying to kill elected representatives, police, and all that, and here we are not just about three months later, and that structure, mass commercial media, whatever, is still willing to interview, sit quietly, nod, while these folk, these white nationalists engage in the very deliberate act of re trying to rewrite history or not even trying to rewrite history saying, we don't care. This is our reality and we're just going to pursue it. So much so that in that echo chamber of confusion, you have someone who literally helped create Trumpism drummed out of leadership in the party because the Trumpism she helped create with her warmonger family, with her silent on birtherism approach, she somehow is not seen as being fit enough to salute the flag. So they slot in somebody whose voting record, which is still atrocious as it relates to poor people, black people, but is, is, is actually worse in their minds, in their politics than the one they put out. But I'm saying I have to say that our struggle isn't against individuals. These are systems who have an interest. And as long as their interest is advanced, we are sacrificial. We, we can be sacrificed. So what you're saying is so important. And to use a sports metaphor that became a meme in pop culture, thanks to these Gen Zers or Gen Y, whatever they want to say, when they would say, say uh, uh, protect beast mode at all costs, because he was like, we must protect narrative. We must protect Karen Hunter at all costs. We have to protect because what happens with Malcolm, Malcolm was not protected. Malcolm was not protected. And so after he is slain and his lieutenants, Yuri Koshiyama, Earl Grant, Peter Bailey, Muriel Feelings, are left there. Benjamin Kareem, who was the Muslim Mosque Incorporated. Y'all want to, you know, because I said he had that religious piece, right? I think I had Brother Kareem. Yeah. It's Ben Kareem's book, a little small book. It's interesting. He co-authored it, but actually he did it. Remembering Malcolm, the, the, you know, with Peter Scuttles, you know, you got these people coming, going to help him write, whatever. Remembering Malcolm, the story of Malcolm X, Minister Benjamin Kareem. There's Benjamin Kareem with Malcolm. He was with the Muslim Mosque Incorporated side. You know, these young lieutenants say, what are we going to do? I should mention this, by the way, because I mentioned uh, Ralph Wiley because uh, by, by saying that when the Malcolm X movie that we're all familiar with came out, um, with perhaps the greatest living actor, not black actor, actor, yeah. Although, you know, I, for I don't, I, I don't like that hierarchical ranking because you like different people for different things. I think Jeffrey Wright, for example, mm. is one of the most remarkable. That's I mean, as a oh, as an ex actor myself, I mean, Jeffrey Wright because Jeffrey Wright can literally play other people, anybody, anybody. Denzel Washington is a hell of an actor, but he's usually playing somewhere around Denzel, my man. So he's going to usually play around Denzel, right? Uh, Felicia Rashad, who just got appointed Dean of Fine Arts at Howard. Wonderful actress, but she's usually going to play around Felicia Rashad. Jeffrey Wright can literally become somebody else. So I'm, I'm just saying, anyway, that haven't been said. So Tom Hanks, that's all cute. Well, yeah, Tom Hanks usually playing Tom Hanks. I ain't, you know, you know. But, and I ain't mad at him. Hey, great actor. But Denzel, of course, plays Malcolm. And for a generation and then generations subsequently, because we don't go past the movement and memory. See those categories, those African states categories. The reason we created them was so that we could have a conversation, internal conversation and think about our complexity, our contradictions and then move ahead. But another reason we picked them is because or created them was because they apply to all human groups. So Western society, American society, English society. They also have movement and memory. The problem comes in when movement and memory of people who are against you is used to narrate your movement and memory. So instead of Malcolm X, you have people coming out of Spike Lee's movie saying, OK, now I know what happened. You have no idea. Betty Shabazz herself. So I wish I could have been who Angela. That's, you know, will you marry me? Yes. I'm like, oh, man, this is a, I'm looking at Betty Shabazz. If you've ever watched Betty Shabazz when she was that age. Like that day, them white boys put that microphone in her face, ask her just as she's still in the clothes she was wearing when she saw her husband slaughtered. And she was like, of course, my husband was under constant assault. I mean, when Kathy Hughes talks about Betty Shabazz as being one of them sisters who you don't really, you know, <laughs> and when she realized, she said, yeah, we need to talk. Betty Shabazz, she said, Betty Shabazz ain't never had no whole lot of words. And she said, Betty Shabazz like Dick Gregory. They were in all the meetings. 
So they were at the NAACP, they were at the Urban League, they also with the whole core Black Nationalists. When she shows up at Gary in 72, she got an armed guard. All these people, because the Black Nationalists are with her, the Panthers are with her. She's out there at the Free Huey rally. She could walk in all the worlds in the governance structure, but the social structure would look at that and say, okay, now, why are you over there with those hardcore Black Nationalists? They're anti-American. Betty Shabazz is like, <laughs> I am there because this is where my people are. Yeah, and it's Dr. Shabazz. Because remember, after Malcolm is killed, they don't have any income. Because he's out of the nation. They didn't firebomb the house. I'm going to talk about that in a second. We talk about the Republic of New Africa in a minute. Um, so who comes together? Ozzy and Ruby D, Harry Belafonte, Sidney Portier. They raised the money. In fact, uh, here's Ilyasha's book, Growing Up X. Here she is. Look at baby girl with a daddy. <laughs> Ilyasha Shabazz, right, with Kim McLaren. And of course, this is one of her early books. There she is, of course. And y'all know Ilyasha Shabazz. You probably know her. We've talked about these two books. She's 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 telling the story of her father in a kind of historical fiction uh, mode uh, for a new generation. So those of you here in young adult fiction and you young people who are there, you teenagers or even younger, y'all get this X, a novel. This is X, a novel by Ilyasha Shabazz. Right there. There he is right there. He's talking about him growing up. The next one, the next phase just came out. These are the prison years. The Awakening of Malcolm X, a novel. Yashi Shabazz, she wrote another sister, Tiffany Jackson. So she's doing that work. I mention her because it's interesting. Um, The first time that I saw Yashi Shabazz, I was actually at the Schomburg. Because remember, Malcolm, a lot of his papers are at the Schomburg. But the reason they're there is because... Uh, they were almost auctioned off in one of them storage war scenarios out of Florida um, when one of the sisters, and we won't get into that, I mean, again, that's the useless. Anyway, had taken stuff out of Betty's apartment where they had been preserved, had his Quran, had his travel diary, stuff like that. And we're going to talk about the travel. In fact, the travel diary was embargoed for a minute, but our brother, my friend and brother, the great Haki Mabuti, uh, Yasha again, except yeah, here she is, Yasha Al Shabazz, right? Shabazz, still that name. Mm -hmm. That's been published, the Diary of Malcolm X. This is the 1964 year. This clarifies a lot of stuff about what he was and wasn't doing. Uh, you see there, forward by Haki Mabuti, afterward by the great James Cone, Liberation Theology, who wrote the book Malcolm and Martin in America, Third World Press, Black Press. But at any rate, um, when those materials were rescued, people raised money, including a lot of celebrities, uh, passed through the Schomburg, acquired the materials there at the Schomburg, and after having been there and been cataloged, and they did a they did an exhibition. So I went up for the exhibition, and you know I'm going up. I'm gonna spend all day at the Schomburg. I'm looking at every little piece. There's his briefcase. There's the uh, there was something that wasn't there that I'm gonna talk about maybe a little bit later that that I saw somewhere else that I'm talking about. But anyway, it's like wow, this is amazing. The letters back and forth, things he's saying to Elijah Muhammad after he's out of the nation is a whole. I mean, if y'all really want to know about Malcolm, there's enough written that you don't have to really go looking a whole lot about this complex relationship that he had. And so with all, with a number of people. And so I hear somebody is like, well, two things happened that day. Uh, one thing happened. I'm looking. I'm, I'm so absorbed in the pictures and the documents on the wall and the cases. I'm looking. I'm real close on the wall. And then I, you know, you feel somebody close. To you, whatever, and I was like, Man, this is Harry Belafonte. Hey, <laughs> how you doing? How you doing? <laughs> what you doing? Hey, I said, You've seen this stuff a million times, brother. You can never see it enough. And I'm standing there talking to Harry Belafonte, who, of course, entertainers. This is what this is what you heard what Professor Hunter said. What are you doing? So Harry Belafonte during this period, he's not just raising money for SNCC. He's not just bringing briefcases of cash to Dr. King and them. He's in connection with all these people. And when Betty Shabazz and them, and my husband is dead, oh, let's get this money together. We need a house in Queens. These girls got to go to school. She tells the story. I mean, okay, that's what you do. And you ain't got to put it on Instagram. In fact, it's probably better if you don't. In fact, those of you who don't, Shout out to y'all, because in the governance, the social structure don't need to know what everybody doing, because if they find out some of what y'all doing, they're going to try to come for y'all and destroy y'all like them fools in Ohio talking about, we don't want LeBron James. OK, you just shut your mouth. Anyway, so that's the first person. The second person, I'm, I'm continuing, I'm looking, and I heard, yeah, so this is where my sisters and I uh, went to school, and, you know, it was it was terrible. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm too young. I don't remember it, but, but, you know, my sister remembers. I'm like, it's Ilyasha. 
Some girls didn't grow up in the same community I grew up in. So if you close your eyes, you wouldn't match that voice to who you think that is. Again, but imagine living your whole life under not only the spotlight, but the expectation that you're going to be an extension of your parents. That you're going to be an extension of Betty. You're going to be an extension of Malcolm. That you're going to be an extension of that work. That And, and to her credit, Yasha, and not just her. I mean, I love the oldest, you know. So, but please, jump jump in. The oldest is uh, Atala, uh, yes. first, the first. Yes. The first, the first, the first, yes. <laughs> um, I, I had the opportunity to um, work with Ilyasa for her first book, work with her. Um, it didn't end up happening. And I realized in talking with her that there's so much pressure on these kids who were babies when the, they didn't know their daddy. No question. You know, if you think about your daddy when you're four or five, six years old. Not even. You see how little she is. That's what I'm saying. But think about your relationship with your father as a kid. And then if you have the, the, the honor to grow up, like my relationship with my dad in his later years, completely different. I see him completely different than I did as a teenager, than as a little girl. And we got to become like really good friends in his later years, but she didn't get that opportunity. But then the pressure is you're supposed to carry the legacy of a man that you didn't really know. How and that you that? might know through other people's lenses. And that Ilyasa today is able to do the things that she's doing. I'm so incredibly proud. I, I got to you know be with her um, before the pandemic. She was at an event that um, she was uh, one of the moderators on a panel or excuse me, one of the, the, the speakers on a panel. And just, she's so incredible. Like she has grown into this role. No question. She's grown into this role, but it's unfair. The King kids, you oh. know, and, and folks expect something of them. They're not their fathers or their mothers. They did not have the same hardships or the same education or the same background because they carry that name. And we should not place on them the, thr the crown just because that has to be earned as well. And I think Ilyasa has definitely earned that. So Agreed. I'm just Agreed. saying. Uh, and yeah. of course, the two youngest weren't even born yet. She was pregnant with uh, Malak and Malaka. Yes. I mean, M M Malika and Malak. I saw Malak at Mega Everest, in fact, uh, uh, three years ago um, at the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations. Uh, we had our conference in Brooklyn and Mega Everest and uh, Malak came and spoke. I mean, like you say, I mean, not only she wasn't even out of her mother's womb, they were there in, in inside their mother. So, yeah, I mean, but the fact that any of them, I mean, can't even imagine. I mean, one of the most stirring visual representations I've ever seen, and I'm sure I will ever see, is the cover of Life magazine with Mega Everson sitting there inconsolable in the front row of that funeral with Merle trying to console him. I mean, everybody knows, of course, the great Manetta Sleet's picture, Ebony Magazine of uh, of Bernice King there in her mother's lap at the funeral with with uh, Coretta with the with the veil over her. But that picture, man, that boy sitting there, and he's just got that. You know, little children. Yeah, some of y'all been to children at that funeral. But that, but this this boy's father been slaughtered in the driveway, and he and he literally had the will to crawl and drag himself up to that. And any y'all ever been to that uh, house down there in Jackson? Some of y'all know. In fact, they they spoke to us from there. Remember, Karen, yeah. a couple came in. A couple that came in. Yep. That little portico, right, right in the same neighborhood as Margaret Walker Alexander, the great Margaret Walker Alexander, who we should probably do one of those things in narrative on. We need to talk about her because I was just rereading Jubilee. In fact, but that community. So that boy. That's a different kind of trauma. You, I mean, I mean, my God, you saw, and then you, you're old enough, and he's sitting there, and he just got this look on his face, like just like he looked. It's like an abstract look. He's sitting there, like, and you see her with her hand on his back, you know, and he just looking like, what the, I mean, what am I going to do? So I mean, the idea then that they would not only grow into adulthood with some sanity, but then somehow embrace and extend that legacy. So when we start talking about what we expect of folks, and then our expectations aren't that you just pursue whatever you enjoy in life, but that you use that as the great Stokely Carmichael used to say, do something for your people. So one of your colleagues, one of your comrades, the great Ralph Wiley, of course, when Spike Lee's Malcolm X was, uh, was being made, shadowed Spike Lee, interviewed him, wrote things up, and then they published this. And so if you wanna talk about the book, by any means necessary, the trials and tribulations of making of Malcolm X, including the screenplay, that's Spike Lee and Ralph Wiley. And Terry McMillan wrote the introduction. I'm mentioning it because a, a generation after he 
made transition, there were already attempts to do retrospectives on Malcolm with some distance. Uh, this, for example, is the February 1990, 25 years later, uh, issue of, as you know, Emerge, right? Mm -hmm. Malcolm X, 25 years later. Very interesting. Uh, Playfell Benjamin, of course, who you know. <laughs> <laughs> Playfell Benjamin, would Malcolm now be Farrakhan? I mean, there's so much we could talk about today because, uh, and then of course the, the headline, because a lot of people wrote in here, Malcolm's journey from troubling prophet to icon. Okay, that should tell you all you need to know where Emerge's editorial head was at that time. The governance structure question, who are we to each other, isn't a question of how do we all think alike. The governance structure question is how are we having conversations, including how are our conversations being shaped by external actors? That's why I started with that Malcolm quote. When you see a Negro with a little bit better clothing on who's a butler, that's because the master got more money. That ain't because this person made a come up. So y'all looking at all these employees who are blinging it out and doing all this kind of thing. Come on, y'all. We got to be smarter than that. But that's 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 a generation later. I just wanted to mention that on the way back to where we were in 1969. When they do Malcolm X, the man of his times, John Clark is able to get them a deal and Clark gets them a deal with Macmillan. So it's edited with introduction and commentary by John Rick Clark, assisted by Peter Bailey and Earl Grant, because by this time, Clark is doing a lot of work. He's done work with Freedom Ways, the copyright, because again, what is their goal? They want to preserve this, but they got to make sure they take care of the Shabazzes. Who's got the copyright? Copyright, Clark, Grant, Bailey, copyright. Betty Shabazz, mm -hmm. meaning what? You're showing people they dedicated to the children, the children of Malcolm X with the hope that they will see the tomorrow of his dreams. And they get into it. And I'm just gonna mention very quickly from the last days of Malcolm X, Earl Grant's piece, that picture with Yuri Koshiyama. He says, oh, by the way, do you know when he begins this? On December 5th, 1963, the national press reported that Malcolm X had been suspended from the Black Muslim Organization and silenced for 90 days. I knew something was seriously wrong. I had resigned from the Black Muslims two years before. As a former Muslim, I knew that they never advertised their internal affairs. Since leaving the Muslims, I had not had any contact with Brother Malcolm. Now, out of curiosity and anxiety, I telephoned Malcolm at his home. He was surprised and pleased to hear from me. Earl Grant ends up being part of the armed bodyguard. Earl Grant ends up being part of the group that begins to guard the house. Earl Grant is there. Uh, he gets the phone call at 4 a.m. around 3 a.m. the morning of February 14th, 1965, that the house is firebombed. He gets his guns and go out there and meet the brothers and they surround the house. So Earl Grant was there and Earl Grant was there when they when Malcolm breathed his last. And so I'll say this very quickly. He said, OK, Malcolm's been shot. He said the brothers and sisters were doing the best they could for Brother Malcolm. When they were able to get his coat and shirt open, I took one look and knew that it was too late. No man could have survived that many bullet holes in his chest and still survive. Really, there was nothing I could do for Malcolm now. Here's the sentence. I thought to get my camera and get some photographs. They might be useful later. You know why they might be useful? He doesn't know, but he's going to take the pictures. And one of the pictures he took of the pictures you've seen of that was that picture with Yuri, Yuri Koshiyama cradling Malcolm's head. Next paragraph, he says, hey, it was about 10 minutes later. It was now about 10 minutes after the first shot had been fired. Although some brothers had run out to get a doctor and we were directly across the street from Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center, it took almost half an hour for a stretcher to arrive. Then about five minutes later, a most incredible scene took place. Into the hall sauntered, this is the word he uses, sauntered about a dozen policemen. They were strolling at about the pace one would expect of them if they were patrolling a quiet park. They did not seem to be at all excited or concerned about the circumstances. The social structure killed Malcolm X, even though black people pulled the trigger. And with all due respect to Netflix, again, that's not our movement in memory, even as black people are involved. What's the standard we're going to require people? This is not a where's Waldo to find somebody who everybody knew who it was and everybody knew what they were living <laughs> In fact, if you from Jersey, you knew who you knew who they was talking about. And if you want to read about it, oh come on, son. If you want to read about it, you don't need you don't need to watch the Netflix piece. You need to get my friend Baba Zach Kondo's book, uh, Conspiracies on the Assassination of Malcolm X. Oh, I thought I had it around here. Anyway, y'all know what's gonna happen in about 30 seconds. I'm gonna see it, but I'm just gonna mention it to you. It's called Conspiracies. 
It's the best book on the assassination of Malcolm. But I, I don't want to spend too much time on any, I don't spend any really more time on that. I want to get now to what we should be talking about most importantly, which is the meaning. What is the meaning of Malcolm? Oh, that's too bad. Because that book is uh, Zach, uh, Bob Zach's bringing it back into print. So one of these days we'll annotate this and then we'll hold the book up. So don't that's worry. right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's too bad because you know I'll start. All right. So let me let me bring it back and and, and reset. Not reset, but 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 figure this out so we and, can talk. And, about. and before you do, let me just say you know the the names that you mentioned, all the parenthetical comments about people. That's part of the remembering. Yes. Seed. Um. And for those of you who are you know, distracted by it, you know, get your life. It's okay. It's all right. Because no it's important that those breadcrumbs are dropped because that's how we bring people back into the fold and back into being remembered. That's by right. others. So continue. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Because that is a, this is an unbroken chain. It's a genealogy. And that's an important point to know that some folk, and you know, we got folk who are donating scholarships to narrative for folks who can't afford it. There's a monthly uh, price you can do, you can subscribe for me you know, month by month. But the reason that that's being built is so that we can have the resources to do this completely independent and that we can have these unvarnished and serious conversations. And the reason that, you know, folk like Urias and Carl and so many others, the team has really put working hard to annotate uh, these conversations we're having here. And then not only that, but with the universe of conversations over there that aren't just this point of entry uh, work is so that you can stop it, you can see. And so, like I said, I mentioned Zach Kondo's book in that moment, I realized it was up under that other book over here. So here it is, Conspiracies, Unraveling the Assassination of Malcolm X by Zach Kondo, uh, forward by Robert Little, Prelude by Paul Lee. Those of you who kind of drives you crazy when I put a footnote here, because see, in my mind, as we're talking, anything we're talking about, if it's not directly in exactly what I was talking about a minute ago, that's a footnote at the end of a sentence if I was writing this as an article. So when I put this up there and you see Paul Lee's name, watch this. Here comes a footnote. Paul Lee had that thing that I mentioned to you was not in the Schomburg collection. Um, it was a very in interesting piece that um, I saw in Detroit that he brought with him when I met Paul Lee. Um, and let me see if I can do this in yeah, I can do this in like under two minutes. Paul Lee is one of the great researchers on Malcolm X. One of the greatest. You've probably never heard his name before. He's very quiet. You know, don't really, you know, good brother, incredible brother. Highland Park, Michigan. Um, I met Paul Lee back in like 1994, 95. I was in Detroit for an ASCAC meeting, Association of Study Classic Organizations. Um, I had snuck away to go over to Ed Vaughn's bookstore. Those of you from Detroit know Ed Vaughn. For years in the Michigan House of Representatives, had old, has the oldest black bookstore in Detroit and went over to Vaughn's bookstore. You know, I'm in there. I came out. Uh, I saw as I'm getting in my car, another car had pulled up and I had these bags of books, whatever. And the brother got out in some kind of way. I don't know how we even started talking, but he asked me, he said, what'd you get? And I said, I showed, he said, oh, what you know about this? What you know about this? You know how people be trying to test you. I'm like, who's this dude? Who's this cat? Who's this? He said, all right, now I'm going to find out if you're serious about books. So then he reaches into a bag, pulls out a photograph. And he says, what you know about this? Who's in this photograph? I said, come on, man. It was Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. Now, pause, because here's a footnote on the footnote. There uh, is uh, there are a couple of books. Actually, let me show you uh, the best one first. My man, Ishmael Reed, writes about Malcolm X in this. He says the Nation of Islam was small when Malcolm joined. In fact, let me not. Let me just read what he says. He says, um. But while Malcolm X drew attention to the Nation of Islam, which before Malcolm X was regarded as a quote unquote cult. And you remember, uh, we'll talk about this in a minute. Louis Lomax, the hate that hate produced Mike Wallace. Uh, they, they produced that. That was the quote unquote introduction of the Nation of Islam to America. No, it was the introduction of Nation of Islam to the social structure in the governance structure. It would introduce a lot of people, too. But a lot of people knew who the nation was. This is the late 50s. Um, Ishmael Reed goes on to say Muhammad Ali's conversion to the religion. Put it on the map. Now going back to Regina King and then one night in Miami, right? When Ali joined, now the nation, man, because what happens in the wake of Ali? Oh, you got all the cats. In fact, I pulled one of Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's books. His name was Lou Al Sunder. The boy playing uh, high school basketball for Power Memorial High in New York. In the summer, however, he is spending time in this after school program that was created by the black folk in, uh, in New York called the Harlem Youth Opportunities 
program. In fact, I, I have, yeah, here's the report. A study in consequences, youth in the ghetto, Harlem Youth Opportunities Unlimited Incorporated. You know who his teacher was in that program? Young Lou Alcindor, John Henry Clark. You know who ran this program out of New York? Cyril deGrasse Tyson, the father of Neil Tyson, the astrophysicist. But at any rate, see, all this stuff is governing. It's the genealogy. I'm saying I have to say that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar writes, man, Dr. Clark was teaching us this stuff and he sent us to do research projects. He said, I lived at the Burr. I became like a monk going to, to, the, to, the, to the chapel. I'm in there every day. I was like, why didn't he tell us this? Why didn't he tell us this? So y'all talking about curriculum? We got to write curriculum? No, we must have the momentum of memory. This ain't the first time we did curriculum. We got a lot of curriculum and it's not fugitive curriculum. This is our governance structure curriculum. So what happens after Muhammad Ali converts, you know, you would not have a Felicia Rashad mm -hmm. in terms of her name if it weren't for the Nation of Islam. Because once Muhammad Ali, uh, once, once Cassius Clay becomes Muhammad Ali, Lou Alcindor eventually becomes Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Bobby Moore becomes Ahmad Rashad. And they start Islam. The point of entry for Islam in many ways in the black community was the nation. Regardless if you stayed in the nation, which is why if you really want to read a very good piece about it, you probably want this book. My man, Michael Gomez's book, Black Crescent, the experience of legacy of African Muslims in the Americas, where he starts on the boat and comes forward. But anyway, as I was saying, that's one of the first the two books on Ali. The other one that's direct uh, on Malcolm and Ali, the other directly on it, which is good, but I like that uh, uh, um, Ishmael Reed book because Ishmael Reed don't pull no punches and he's coming out of the governance structure. This is Randy Roberts and Johnny Smith's book, Blood Brothers, The Fatal Relationship Between Muhammad Ali and Malcolm X. The title of the book tells you just about everything you need to know how the social structure tries to come in and narrate its own movement and memory. In other words, oh, the fatal relationship. So you know it's going to be some violence at the center. It's going to be that old tired narrative about conversion and all this kind of thing. And to the day he made transition, Muhammad Ali, and of course they end, he ends Blood Brothers with saying, you know, eventually Ali saw that Malcolm X was right. It wasn't Elijah Muhammad. See, here y'all go trying to start this mess because Muhammad Ali said as long as he made public comments. In fact, there's a there's a documentary on Muhammad Ali and on the case, the Supreme Court case that he won when he wouldn't go to Vietnam. And it opens with Ali being interviewed. He's advanced stage in the illness, in his illness. And they say, so um, actually, no, no, it's not Ali. It's not Ali. I think I've seen Ali say this, though, but it wasn't in this documentary. You know who it was? It was Farrakhan. Farrakhan, they interviewed Farrakhan. And Farrakhan said, they asked Farrakhan, you know, if he was talking about Ali. And he said, I saw Muhammad Ali. And he said to me, I said, how are you, champ? You have to be strong in this, in the illness. He said, and Muhammad Ali looked at me and he said, still a nigga. Mm -hmm. So I know Bill Clinton, Billy Crystal, all y'all at the funeral, this very nice in the social structure. And you're up there telling stories about how Muhammad saw that it's past color. You got to worry. Just like you stood up over John Lewis and said, you know, Stokely went the wrong way. He, okay, Bill, that's, that's your nice social structure business. But Muhammad Ali himself, very clear. You ain't going to separate out my way of knowing from that other way of knowing about where I am and who I am. And no matter how many times you remix this, you're not going to do it. We're, we're going to talk about Islam in a minute as we kind of wind your clothes and tie this to Palestine because this is very important because we have a direct link to all of that. So as, I, as you were saying, it's a, it's a living genealogy. And that genealogy, which is why we're showing all these books and the footnotes, it may look distracting. The more you study, the more you see it's connected. And the more you see that our momentum of memory has to reconnect to how we're living our lives. We're already influenced by all these movements. So finally, the original footnote going to the point is I put this up, Paul Lee, we're out there in front of this bookstore, Vaughn's bookstore in 1995. And he shows me this picture. That's us, Mr. Michaud. I don't even, oh, look at that. It's close. Good. There are a couple of books on Mr. Michaud's brother. Uh, his brother was a minister. I, I won't go in the other room and get it. It's called uh, About My Father's Business, which is the story of Lightfoot Michaud. These cats were out of Virginia. Uh, he was a minister. The brother, who's in the middle of this picture, here's Malcolm. Here's Muhammad Ali. And in between them is this little dude with a, with a kufi on and some glasses. And this is actually a arduous rendering. <laughs> this is Vonda Michaud Nelson's piece, No Crystal Stair. I've talked about it before. So for those of you who want to go back, in fact, he even got 1958 is when they, you know, look, Louis Michaud talking about this. The truth, if the truth stirs it up, let it come. Because 
Malcolm, after he gets out of prison, Malcolm, after he's in the nation, Malcolm, after he's in Harlem now, Malcolm would go to Mr. Michaud's bookstore for all the stuff because Malcolm was also always reading. So when I saw the little postcard Paul showed me, I was like, that's Mr. Michaud, man. Come on, man. What you trying to say? They, they, had, the, they had the house of proper propaganda on 125th Street. He said, you all right. Then we started talking. He said, what are you in town for? I saw the ASCAP conference. Oh, he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, you know what? I'm going to come over this evening, uh, this afternoon. I got somebody I want y'all to meet. Paul Lee comes after the conference is over. We finished for the day. We're all sitting around. Here come Paul Lee walks in. And that was the first and only time I met Philbert. Philbert Little, the oldest brother of Malcolm X, who worked for the phone company, Michigan Bell, after he left the nation of Islam. And incredibly, sitting there talking, the brother was so warm, just a beautiful brother. He's sitting there talking, just really, you know. And then Paul pulls out of his coat pocket a baggie with a little card, business card. What is this? And it looks like somebody didn't chewed up. He said, this is the card that was in Malcolm's breast pocket the day they killed him. Paul, where did you even get? That? I mean, Paul, <laughs> when I tell you, Paul Lee is one of the most meticulous researchers of Malcolm. Any any Malcolm question I have, I, I just reach out to Paul. And, and I'm not saying that. I'm saying that to say that the people who get the book deals, the people who are out there, you know, and then you read it and it's like very good information. But then they say something that goes all off in the left field or they end it with. And that's why, even though America's not perfect, we have to continue. Where did you even? Where? There's a price you pay if you want access to that social structure. So no matter why, no matter if you're gritting your teeth while you're writing it, and you know damn well you about to uh, in the in one of my favorite phrases from the Nation of Islam, made popular by Malcolm X. Even though you realize that if somebody reading this from your community, they may be hoodwinked, <laughs> they might be bamboozled, <laughs> they might be led astray, run amok. <laughs> in other words, <laughs> you've been hoodwinked, you've been had, you've been took, you've been run amok, <laughs> led astray. <laughs> if y'all ain't never seen that in real life, going to a Nation of Islam meeting and see them cats start going in all the communities, and you are out here thinking these people are your friends. Friends, you've been had. Listen, <laughs> that in Malcolm X, you can hear that rhythm. My point is that you know why you're writing that. To anybody reading that, you know why you got the light on you and you, but the thing about to come out your mouth, about to take your people in another direction if they listen to you. What you don't realize, however, is what you said, Professor Hunter. Are people not listening to you? And the and, and, and our work, alongside everybody else doing this work, and there are so many doing this work. In fact, our work is to never let our communities forget that you're not crazy. That yes, you've worked and that what you're thinking, other people are thinking and that we need to connect, which is why uh, I, you mentioned Manny Marable's book. There are two good anthologies because what happened when that book came out and there's a very good, in fact, the most valuable thing I think about Marable's book is the companion volume the portable Malcolm X reader, Garrett Felber, who was a graduate student there at Columbia, Manning Marable. And I knew Manning Marable. I mean, Manning Marable, brilliant brother, very important uh, thinker. Um, Manning Marable, very influential. The two books that, that took me out of deciding I was going to practice law and move me in the direction that I eventually took. After my first year of law school, I read How Capitalism Underdeveloped Black America by Manning Marable and Malefisante's Afrocentricity. Afrocentricity introduced the concept that we have to find ways to speak and to study and to think from uh, ways of knowing that emerged from our genealogies. That started me. And then of course, uh, very quickly after that, I found um, Alana Karinga, but then uh, Jacob Carruthers and others. And even Manny Marable, hardcore social scientist, materialist, very astute analysis. And when you read the book on Malcolm, um, it doesn't read like his earlier books. It doesn't, it, even the language is very different. And understanding it was written uh, for a different audience, and understanding he's very sick near the end. In fact, I was at Columbia for a conference. I was at New York for a conference. I went up to Columbia looking for him. By then, he was too ill to even come in the office. And some of this, uh, his assistants were up there editing stuff. And I realized, OK, uh, how much of this is writing? How much is this is rewriting? And so what comes out in that book, you know, whatever the, the critiques of the book are, please understand that the social structure then turns around and gives that book all the awards and says it's the definitive piece. Now, of course, less pain. Uh, who was still alive at that time, of course, his daughter finishes The Dead Are Rising, which has some valuable and interesting information in it, particularly near the back end of the book, uh, is out. But there's enough on Malcolm that you don't need any of those narratives. 
people say, well, is the is the autobiography true? Is it if it is not true? Ask some cats that protected young Malcolm in prison whether it's true or not true. It resonates in terms of ways of knowing. And this is a good because it's primary documents. These are FBI files. They are surveilling Malcolm's family as early as his parents. Here's where the police are interviewing Earl Little in Lansing, Michigan. Here go the Michigan State Police talking about what, hap uh, what happened to him. Here is uh, Earl Little's death. There's the estate, I mean, the estate uh, settlement. So there are a lot of these is primary documents. I'm, that's why I'm bringing it up. But after Malcolm, uh, after the book Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention comes out by Manning Marable, um, who has made, who had made transitions, published by students, and they gave it all the awards, uh, two very valuable and very important volumes come out to uh, to analyze that book in a larger context of who Malcolm was and wasn't, because he's one of the most written about people there is. I mean, I, I'm probably, I probably got about 40 books here, and that's just a fraction of, of them. Uh, this is uh, the one that came out of Third World Press, By Any Means Necessary, Malcolm X, Real, Not Reinvented, Critical Conversations on Manny Marable's Biography of Malcolm X, uh, Herb Boyd, the great Herb Boyd, Ron Daniels, my man, Dr. Daniels, Milana Karingo, of course, and Haki, my booty. This is Third World Press. So the Black Press, those of you saying, oh, yeah, the Black Press. Did. And the other one are my friends, Jared Ball and Todd Stephen Burroughs, who did uh, the book, A Lie of Reinvention, Correcting Manny Marable's Malcolm X. I mean, you talk about shots fired and they go all the way down here in it. There's a lot of people in here, including Bill Strickland. I'm going to mention Bill Strickland because those of you who are remembering Malcolm, a personal critique of Manny Marable's non-definitive biography of Malcolm X, he said, that's kind of harsh. Well, it probably should be because Bill Strickland is the editor of another piece I think is very important. And then I'm going to come back to the narrative as we're talking. Malcolm X, Make It Plain. This is the companion book to the documentary that was done for, C uh, for um, PBS. Those of y'all seen Malcolm X, Make It Plain. You should get the book because uh, it's oral histories. Bill Strickland wrote the text, but the sister Cheryl Green has all these oral histories and they have a Malcolm X document documentary production team. But the reason why this is important is because the same team that did Eyes on the Prize, it's a black team, Black Side Productions, the great Henry Hampton. Let's talk about Ken Burns. If you know Ken Burns' name, social structure, and don't know Henry Hampton, governance structure, then you don't know black filmmaking. Most of this book is direct quotes from people who knew Malcolm. So if you're watching that documentary, and you hear John Henry Clark, for example, talking, what's in this book is an excerpt of the longer interview. So I'm saying, I'm saying and Strickland has a piece in Jared and Todd's book. And this is an excellent book, a very important book. Now, all that haven't been said, why is it important to know what we, to, to, to know beyond what the social structure wants Malcolm to be? Now we reset and bring it home. What kind of society do we live in where this man is one of the most hated black people in the country, one of the most hated people in the country, then he's killed, pause, and then re-narrated as an American hero? That should tell you all you need to know about ignoring what the social structure has to say, except if they're going to lead you to some sources you didn't know about. That's how I read, unfortunately, more and more books. As the books come out, the sentences get shorter, they get less definitive, they get more awards, and I'm saying, okay, let me just read this quickly and look for the footnotes and see if, okay, okay, and fewer and fewer footnotes, and they blame it on the readers. Nah, nah, don't do that. All right, let's bring it together. Let's end where we begin. When we look at what's happening now in the so-called Middle East, as John Ricard said, east of what? Middle between what? But we know what we're talking about. We are going to bring Malcolm in one final time to what's going on right now in the West Bank and Gaza. And we're going to use we're going to use that last year of his life. We're going to use this uh, sister out of England, Marika Sherwood. Malcolm X visits abroad. That's it. Remember, I told you Peter Bailey's working on an international book on Malcolm. This is uh one of the uh, first ones, even though it's kind of late, April 1964 to February 1965. Guess what? In fact, it came out in 2011. That's funny. <laughs> I was reading this uh, on my way to Gil Scott Heron's uh, memorial service. So they go to uh, the obituary. <laughs> so that's crazy. Anyway, guess who had something to say about the conflict in the Middle East? In fact, 
Let me just show you a table of contents. These are all the places he went in that year. Mecca, Beirut, Cairo, Nigeria, Ghana, Morocco. He's back in New York, the OAAU, June 1964, London, Cairo, Kenya, Tanzania. Oh, Tanganyika, Zanzibar, which become Tanzania. Addis, he's in Ethiopia, then Nigeria, Ghana, Liberia, Guinea, Algiers, Geneva, Paris, Mount London. The point, Malcolm's voice was silenced for something you don't see in that Netflix, Who Killed Malcolm X? That's the where Walt, where's Walter, where they're going to bring it back to America, talk about black involvement, and, and mention the FBI, because they know they can't get away with anything like that without talking about the FBI, which is to your point, Karen, the fact that our consciousness won't require that. We say, oh, all y'all sell out, whatever. No, but it was the internationalism that put him in the bullseye. He's connected to all these people. He stopped in uh, London, uh, Jan Carew, the great Jan Carew, uh, who spent his last years at the University of Louisville, uh, was in London at the time. He, he did a little book called Ghosts in Our Blood, where he talks about that. But most importantly, let me show you the first chapter of this book in terms of Malcolm and what we're gonna what we're ending with. Chapter one: Black Internationalism, Malcolm X and the Rise of Global Solidarity. Chapter two, the fire this time, SNCC, Jews, and the demise of the beloved community. Chapter three, reformers, not revolutionaries, the NAACP, Bayard Rustin in Israel. Chapter four, balanced and guarded, Martin Luther King Jr. on the Arab-Israeli tightrope. Wait, what are you, what's this book? Hmm. There it is right there. Michael Fishbach's book, Black Power and Palestine. As our brother, this came out two years ago, 2019. As our brother, my friend and brother, um, Mark Lamont Hill finishes a documentary on Palestine. As you see what has happened, anytime Mark says something about Palestine, speak at the UN, which Malcolm, by the way, said the United States should be brought before the United Nations. And, and Marika Sherwood and so many others write about that. Why N. Clyde read a whole book on Black Malcolm X and black internationalism. Um, yeah, I'm gonna keep this in my hand because I'm gonna talk about this in a second. In fact, let me talk about it now. When you start taking our struggle in this settler colony and linking it to the struggle of oppressed peoples globally, the social structure pushes back because the narrative has to be narrated in a way that says, no, your fate is tied to the fate of this settler project. And so your best bet is to be with us. And so when, Mal when Malcolm made that quote, oh, you got, oh, wow, you can get any kind of iPhone you want in the United States. Why would you want to go anywhere else? Yeah, you can get an iPhone like that because you know how much money Apple made during the plague. In other words, don't. Yeah, don't look at your material conditions as indicative of black progress. This is the global crisis in capitalism that is continuing to be pushed. And so anytime we start connecting to people all over, whether it be Yuri Koshiyama going international and connecting to folk, okay, you got an FBI file like this. That's how they're able to write our biography, right? Whether it's Malcolm traveling, you look at this, you look in the uh, documents, they got all the FBI, CIA, they coordinating, talking to governments and things like that. Whether you are... Um, attempting as Martin Luther King is to, to, to talk about the connections to people struggle. Oh no, we got a problem. It isn't the fight for civil rights. Civil rights is a safety valve. It's going to be a fight to get it, but ultimately that's not going to cost the country what it will cost if you in front of the UN, which is a problem. And then here's the real problem. It isn't the college professors. It isn't the people on TV. It's them grassroots people you're talking to because Malcolm's house was bombed on the 14th of February. 1965. He said Earl Grant and then went out there. He was supposed to go to Detroit. And so the people in Detroit like, what? They bombed your house? He said, yeah. I'm still coming. Huh? And this little pamphlet I'm about to show y'all. We all talking about reparations now? With all due respect to everybody writing about it now from Sandy Darity to the, uh, my brother Tanasi Coates and all them recently. The momentum of memory. See, reparations was never an American conversation only. The engagement with the social structure on the question of reparations for black people in this country has always been in the in the context of international liberation struggles, which is where we're going to talk about Palestine in a minute. Here's the revised edition of a little pamphlet called War in America, the Malcolm X Doctrine. Brother Amari, whose slave name was Richard B. Henry. That <laughs> is my friend, the great Amari Obadeli. He's an ancestor now. In fact, you know who writes about him and writes about him a lot is a sister who he greatly influenced, who she worked with uh, for years in the reparation struggle, our sister in Kichi Taifa. She writes about him in Black Power, Black Lawyer. Milton Henry and Richard Henry, the Henry brothers, Imari Abu Bakari, Amari Obadeli, and um, Gaidi Obadeli, uh, who were joined later by comrades like Chokwe Lumumba, whose son is now the mayor of Jackson, 
uh, whose sister's down there helping you engage in this struggle. I mean, her, the, the the mayor's sister, Chokwe's sister, uh, Rakia, their father, their parents, Nubia and Chokwe, all them involved in the organization that came after Malcolm was assassinated. Listen to what uh, Obadelli says, Amari Obadelli. He says, hold on, let me see. Let me get to, let me see. Ah, yes. Of the three brothers who bear witness for Malcolm X, known as we were by our slave name, the Henry brothers, only Milton was sure from the beginning. I was the last to come to the realization that it, it was he who should come and that there was no need to look for another. I personally saw or spoke to Malcolm X. This is Imario Bedelli, who wrote his dissertation at Temple, by the way, a book he published as America, the nation state. Uh, if you are now writing about America, now y'all need to go read Amari Obadelli. He says, I personally saw and spoke to Malcolm X only on four occasions. One was in Washington, in the lobby of the headquarters hotel just before the 1963 March on Washington. Wait, these black nationalists are down at the March on Washington? Yeah, remember what Malcolm said about the March? Oh, by the way, when they would have meetings in Detroit, one of the places that was offered for them to have meetings, in fact, they were at a meeting when the police shot up in there and they kept the bullet holes in the wall to make sure, and nobody ever forgot that the police attacked these black people was in a church called New Bethel. The pastor, C.L. Franklin, didn't see that in that, uh, in other words, the social structure not about to tell y'all that Aretha Franklin, C.L. Franklin and them was all part of the black nationalist and pan-Africanist movement, which is one reason Farrakhan was on the podium sitting next to Bill Clinton at her funeral because she said she wanted in there. We talk about Malcolm and Farrakhan, all that as well is very important in the, in the government structure, but please don't lose sight of the fact that when the Panthers asked her to raise money and she couldn't come to the concert, she sent a letter to the Panthers on the West Coast and said, I'm sorry I can't come, but I support y'all completely. Signed, Aretha Franklin, Queen Mother of Soul. Not Queen of Soul, that's the social structure because they like the music. You better think and respect. But in the governance structure, she was known as the Queen Mother of Soul. See, because like Queen Mother, that's like Queen Mother Moore in the reparations movement. That is a relationship to a governance structure and of course Angela Davis when they were saying you know Angela Davis arrested if they're gonna are they gonna give her bail Rich Franklin was like I don't care how much it is you tell me the number I'll pay her bail see that don't fit in now you go back and remix CL remake or re with great acting but y'all what y'all looking at that y'all better stop looking at other people's versions of our movement and memory and look for your own so the first time he saw him was in the March on Washington lobby he said then he said, each time Malcolm smiled, shook my hand and spoke with that charismatic courtesy and brotherliness, which Yuri Koshiyama always talks about. But I am sure he did not know me or certainly did not recall me. Twice more we were to meet, one short days before the death of John Kennedy, when he came to Detroit to address a rally sponsored by the civil rights group. And I'm going to come. I'm, in fact, I'm going to. Uh, and then the time the next time was after they fired his house, he came to Detroit. Let me go back to this one here. Because what we don't have time today to talk about is all the other people he spoke with on podiums with when he went down south and talked to the SNCC students when he uh, was on the same podium as Fannie Lou Hamer in New York with the SNCC singers the time they performed Oginga Odinga and Fannie Lou Hamer spoke and Malcolm spoke on the same podium. And you don't ever see those two speeches together, even though they were recorded at the same time. You find Malcolm's speech in the Malcolm anthologies and Fannie Lou Hamer's speech in the Fannie Lou Hamer anthologies. And if you didn't know and there was no introduction, you wouldn't know Fannie Lou Hamer and Malcolm X were in the same place. Fannie Lou Hamer, John Lewis, who met Malcolm X in East Africa when he was over there. SNCC came back, came out against the Vietnam War. And, oh, I should mention this other thing. This is what I mentioned about the, this meeting in November 1963, the group one advanced leadership goal, because the black people in Detroit are coming together. The Nation of Islam is born in Detroit. And for those of you who want to know a little Nation of Islam history, I encourage you to go read the voluminous literature on the Nation of Islam, but read what they write about themselves probably first. Also understand the nation comes into existence around 1930, 1931. They always talk about Master Fahad Muhammad as the, the kind of the, the leader. And then of course he disappears and Elijah Muhammad becomes the head. What is often also referred to is cats like Noble Drew Ali and the Moorish Science Temple, North Noble Drew Ali. There's a recent book on him, Jacob Dorman. Uh, again, read it for the sources, The Princess and the Prophet, The Secret History of Magic, Race and Moorish Muslims in America. Again, social structure trying to demystify. You can, Noble Drew Ali, I know some of y'all in the Moorish Science Temple, y'all know that history. You may not have heard of, or may have heard of another brother may have may or not have heard of another name, Duze Muhammad Ali. Duze Muhammad Ali was a brother who came out of the Garvey movement. His mother was Sudanese, father Egyptian. He grew up in, in England, 
became a stage actor, started a newspaper called the African Times and Orient Review. Then Garvey is working for him. So that stream that Hubert Harrison, if you go to narrative, we talk about Hubert Harrison, is influencing Garvey. Dudes Muhammad Ali is also influencing him. And he ends up in Detroit. It's a very good book called Old Islam in Detroit, Recovering, Rediscovering the Muslim American Past. What Mike, let me now tie it together. What I'm saying is Detroit was a place where all these streams converged. So you had the Muslims, a lot of non-black Muslims. But in America, if you didn't come over on the boat as a Muslim, as an African, the reintroduction of Islam in America came through black communities. Detroit was very important, Chicago as well. This is why in the nation of Islam, Detroit is known as Mecca and Islam uh, and Chicago is known as Medina, the second holiest site. But all those things are together. You got the Christians, you got the Muslims, you got, uh, uh, what's my man's name? Um, black Christian nationalism. Albert Clay, whose daughter Pearl Clay, y'all know the playwright, right? He, black Christian nationalism, all that stuff's coming out of Detroit. When the Obadelli brothers go to hear Malcolm in 1963, you know what they do? They say, we need to record this. Richard Henry and his brother, Milton hold up a recording device while Malcolm gives the speech that we listen to now. It's called Message to the Grassroots. This is very important. The, the, the Obadelli brothers are the reason we have that recording. And guess who helps them uh, produce it and publish it? I'm sorry, and, 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 and distribute it after they've gotten it printed. Uh, this cat who has this little group, he's creating, you know, Tamala Records, and then I think it became known as Motown. Oh, Barry Gordy. Yeah. So while everybody's bopping to the Supremes and the four top, understand it, all of it. And this is the foundation for what becomes the reparations movement that now that the smoke has cleared and it looks like something might happen. People drop out of left field in academia. I think this is how we should do it. Now, nah, see, see, this is the approved dialogue, but the courage it takes to step out when this is considered. Y'all can't talk about this. The courage shown by uh, Corey Bush, Jamal Bowman and them on the floor, Rashida Tlaib and them on the floor of the House of Representatives the other day when they started talking about what's going on in Palestine. It all connects to courage that was shown before. And when Malcolm, finally, when Malcolm starts talking about global solidarity and what's going on in Palestine. Remember 1948, the creation of the state of Israel. The creation of the state of Israel was... Uh, it wasn't guaranteed that Israel was going to be where it was. It ain't even about Israel. This is where it, when we started, you say, you know, we got to be delicate because we need to be very clear. The state of Israel is all about settler colonialism. So don't get no arguments about Judaism, anti-Semitism, Semites. Just, just hold that out for a second. The British are the ones dispossessing people who lived in that region of their land. And they have been doing that as part of their larger settler colonial project that has us having this conversation in English over the last 500 years, almost. One of the early places they proposed to these people who are looking for a homeland. This is distinct from the looking for homeland. Looking for a homeland could fit under the title Zionism. They're looking for a Zion. Some of y'all grew up in the church like I did, Baptist church. Y'all remember, we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching forward to Zion, the holy city of God. Mm -hmm. So we Christians, they are Jews, but Zion, we're looking for the place. You know, one of the places that the British tried to put off on those people looking for a place? Uganda. There's the book, Robert Weisberg, African Zion, right? East Africa. And then they say, it's very interesting because this book now, mind you, this book was published in 1968. Robert, and there's been a lot written since, but I like this book because sometimes I like the older books because then you can kind of go back before people try to start finessing language. And what Riseborough talks about is white settlers in East Africa and many Palestinian-centric Zionists, he makes a distinction. You got some settlers who are in East Africa. You got some who are saying, no, we want Palestine because there's no Israel at this time. He calls them paleocentric. Pali Palestinian-centric Zionists viewed the proposed Jewish settlement as a major threat, and debate in both camps was heated. Zionism, there's no, there's no consensus in Zionism. There's a debate, was a debate, where are we going to go? Because of the controversial character and the highly emotional atmosphere in which the drama of the East African Zion was played out, there has been much misunderstanding about the entire project. The identity of the person or persons who conceived and promoted the scheme, their probable motives, the terms of their offer, and the location of the proffered land. Watch this, because we all heard Uganda, right? Who heard it? It was Kenya, not Uganda. 
have been just a few of the indistinct aspects of the story because we don't even get the trickle that we get. A lot of people have heard this for the first time. Now, because the whole thing was, well, where was the Garden of Eden? This is the kind of debate. They're trying to merge this way of knowing into this settler colonial politics and the social structure. Who's coming out against it? Everybody who has suffered settler colonialism. That means you don't have to be a Muslim. You don't have to be an Arab. And those are not the same things. I know some people think they are. And maybe you know we could have that debate another time. And that's important, maybe on the narrative side. But let's be clear. When you're looking at this, you're not looking at Israelis versus Palestinians. You're looking at settler colonialism that was foisted by a social structure that had a whole nother agenda. So when you look at support for Israel, it ain't, oh, they were persecuted. We had the Holocaust and it's terrible. And yeah, all that's true. Now, but why this? Well, you know, there's oil in the region. Well, we can't really say that. So what we have to do is continue. And then the question becomes, who does that benefit beside the oil companies, between the natural resources, between the people who are trying to keep a lid on whatever the other countries, the Arab countries around there, trying to keep a lid on them changing the geopolitics. You don't have to be part of that cabal to have an interest in saying, well, we don't care why you're doing it. This is why I'm doing it. Why? Because I believe I read my book, my scripture, my Torah, and we're supposed to be here. Okay, that's your agenda. That's different than their agenda. But do you understand to this child that you just killed, family? Y'all all all the same. And so then when you start talking about that, self-interest? Now, pause. Take that debate. Take that argument overseas. And here's where it gets crazy. Because in this set of colony called the United States of America, People who are Jewish aren't all white. They are mostly white. Meaning in this race based society. I'm not white. I'm Jewish. No, you white. You could be white and Jewish because in this society, they make you choose and white and Jews get lumped with white people. And so the idea, in fact, he opens the book Black Power in Palestine with a meeting that a Jewish councilman in Los Angeles has with some black power activists in the in the late 60s, like 1967, I think it is. Let me give you the exact date because I don't want to give any misinformation. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, let me let me I'm glad I saw that. So what happens is after World War Two, there's a, they, they're going to put now this group of Zionists. OK, we're going to give you that part of Palestine because we got that right now. This is what they did even in Africa after World War One, World War II. They got a protectorate. They're going to take, you know, now. 1948. Create the state of Israel. Ralph Bunch, black man, gets the Nobel Prize as part of the UN delegation. That's a different conversation in the governance. Structure. Who is Ralph Bunch to us? We're proud of Ralph Bunch. Yeah, you better go back and read that correspondence. There's a lot of people who said, no, nah, Ralph Bunch. And the Africans, like Patrice Lumumba, eventually saying, we don't want to talk to Ralph Bunch. Why are you the errand boy for the UN? In other words, and Bunch himself. Is seeing these kind of read Charles Henry's work, read Brian Urquhart works on Paul on, 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 on Ralph Munch. Then the next date that's important, 1967, the so-called Six Day War. During the Six Day War, the it's, it's the Israeli military who's getting all the support from these colonial powers who want Israel to exist against everybody who was there already, including all those Arab states. The Africans, the non-whites are all siding, most of them siding with the Arabs and unless they got some stake with the settlers as well. And so what you see in six days, you see the, the radical expansion, Gaza, West, you know, West Bank, all that. And so since then, since 1967, in other words, you're in my lifetime, Professor Hunter, this has been an ongoing struggle. And the black people in the United States who organized, who are in this book, including Malcolm, including Martin Luther King, fit into two categories. You've got the black establishment, quote unquote, civil rights leaders who come out in support of Israel. Why? Their funding, their livelihood is tied to the American American philanthropists. Some philanthropists that are giving money are part of the Jewish, same Jewish community and the Jewish community is not monolithic. But some of these people are giving money and they're also drawing inspiration from the black freedom struggle. They've, they've risked their lives. They've been out there. But they also support Israel. And these people say we can't come out against Israel. This is a problem. Now, who ain't got sense enough to go along with that? The young people. So that same student nonviolent coordinating committee that comes out against Vietnam, who is inspired by Malcolm X, while the Henry brothers are in Detroit and they start something called a Malcolm X club that becomes the Republic of New Africa, a pillar of the reparations movement. They while they're doing that in the SNCC people in the South. They looking at Malcolm like, yeah, and they're saying in Mississippi, we're against the Vietnam War. And they come out 
against what's going on in the Six Day War in 1967, and they are eviscerated. This is SNCC because they say SNCC has become anti-white. They didn't put the white people out of SNCC. They done. They done. Now they supporting this anti-Semitic. They supporting these. Whoa, way, ho, 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 and the money dries up. The money dries up, and so what you then see in this process is if you come out for the Palestinians, meaning you come out against settler colonialism, it you get swirled into this thing where well, you're against the Jews and you're, hold on, hold, it don't, no, 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 no. This is about land dispossession. This is about settler colonialism. And if you, I mean, chapter four, Martin Luther King, he sees it and he, he doesn't come out for Israel uncritically. And that puts him in the crosshairs. Um, Bayard Rustin, Andrew Young, you know, they got a seat at the table eventually. Remember when Andrew Young was the UN ambassador? You got to stand up and salute and he doesn't do it the way, oh no, you got to go. So I guess what I'm saying is that when we look at what's going on today, if you speak out and say you should not be killing, you almost have to say, if you're trying to remain viable in places that control your funding and all this kind of stuff, you almost have to say, we. We don't. We're against killing of all kind. Poor Kerry Washington on social media. Well, I'm against killing of all kind. And then people came for her. Like, yeah, they throw if they throwing rocks or these rockets that don't hit nobody. And then the Israeli army gets in a plane and starts bombing. And guess what? Reading the New York Times, reading the Financial Times, which I do every day on print and online. Here's the here. Look, there's the New York Times. Here's Financial Times. They messing with the money. West Bank clashes threaten new front in Israel Palestinian conflict. The fact that they said Israel-Palestinian conflict and not Israel protecting its interests some kind of way means that they can't even defend what's going on now. But guess what? People don't do what I do. People don't do what a newspaper person like President Hunter does. They going on social media in real time. And Al Jazeera is the one that's, and Al Jazeera got its own issues, but Al Jazeera is going on. So what do you do? Shit, let's just bomb Al Jazeera. That'll stop it. Do y'all understand that these children we're in the streets of Ferguson getting text messages from the Palestinians telling them what kind of stuff to put in their eyes to, to stop your tear gas. I mean, what? You think bombing the website place is going to stop the news from getting out? This is an attempt to finish these Palestinians. To finish them starts at a mosque. So I'm going to stop there before I go any further. Just to say that. I mean, and, and on, on uh, honestly, the Satmars, the largest um, sect of Hasidim, are anti-Zionist. They do Come not on. believe, and these are fiercely Jewish people. They are fiercely Jewish, and they do not believe that Israel should be where it is. So, you know, this is not a, a conversation uh, that could be had lightly, because unfortunately, because of the narratives that are out there, you know, you have to tread lightly. And yes. And you should, because there should be respect in this conversation. Absolutely. Respect for humanity and respect for life should be at the top of everybody's mind. And, and as we frame these, these discussions, that should come first. And the question should be asked, you know, are you on the side of humanity? Do you care about people? And this is not a religious discussion. You know, I even had a discussion with my class about this. This is not about religion. Mm -mm. It's not. It's not. So... Let's it's important you say that a concentration camp is a concentration camp. Now, did they use gas on the Jews? Absolutely. The Jews, the Roma, and the black. Read Furpo Carr, no relation. Hitler's black victims. So that's terrible. We decry it. So is the concentration camp Yuri Koshiyama and her family was in in Arkansas. So were the death camps that we were in called plantations. Can we make a common stand? And this was Malcolm's point. Malcolm, who said, if you're not registered to vote, we need to go door to door and shame anybody who isn't registered to vote. Malcolm X said that in that year before he was dead. Malcolm also said, I'm not anti-white. I'm pro-humanity. That's why I'm talking about human rights, not civil rights. What you just said, Professor Hunter, is so important. Either we're going to be for humanity or we're not. No more hiding places. Okay. On that note, uh, you know, follow him at Africana Car. Uh, and next week we will not be here physically live. We're going to be physically live in narrative because we got work to do. And so this is what that looks like. We had a discussion around souls of black folk, W.E.B. Du Bois, which yes. Dr. Carr and I embedded into the book. So if you're in yeah. a book club, you can see us have that conversation. And I'm remixing what a book club should look like. Book clubs should be actively participating in actually building some things. So 
That's, that's right. me. That's me. So what we're going to do is take the work that W.E.B. Du Bois did when he was here in terms of the 100 year plan. Yes. Start to look at what that should look like now. So that's going to be the framing of our conversation next week in narrative is how do we capitalize or pick up where he pick up the baton that was left behind by uh, Dr. Du Bois and build what needs to be built now. That's right. So okay. maybe it won't be a hundred years. Maybe we don't need a hundred years. Maybe we've, you know, circumvented a lot of the things that he saw problematic a hundred years ago. Maybe it's a 50 year plan. And so we're going to start that discussion next week in narrative. So if you're not joined, join it, join it. Cause I'm looking forward to that. And before I let you go, people are obsessed with your shirt, which is not a narrative. Oh, yet. maybe. Oh, I don't know. But who are these original Maroons? Who are they? World. You know what? Who I is got that? this by the company. Oh, can y'all read it? Because I yeah. Man. All right, all right. Yep. Third, third world f famous. Third world famous. Third world famous. Yes. This nice. is uh, you know who sent me this. Third world famous. Shout out to them, black folk, black owned. Um, I used to see this in Sankofa all the time. But our friends, uh, Sandy Dr. Amon, Dr. Oh. Amon was like, I'm, I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you this shirt. These are look. You know, room five. The the uh, the group. Yes. These are just five Maroons. Queen Nanny, the great Queen Nanny of Jamaica, right? The Maroons. Zumbi, Zumbi of Palmares. If you know about the Brazilians, you know, Daddy Bookman, they go our Haitian cats. Francois Macandal, of course, you know, these are the Haitian boys. And then Captain Cudjo as well, coming back to Jamaica. You see, so in other words, you talk about Maroons, we got a lot of Maroons. So I, I actually, uh, when I got it, I was like, oh, Sonny, this is great. So I put it on to go work with Holly on the Maroon Project this week. He, he was looking at footage from Oklahoma because he's dealing with Maroons from all over. So these are the Negroes that went to Oklahoma. And then some of them kept going to Brackettville, Texas. And then some of them said, you know what? Let's just get out of the United States. And they in Mexico, Nacimiento, Mexico. <laughs> so, um, yes. So we've always figured out how to be free. Mm -hmm. We're going to figure that out. Uh, oh, we're going right. to figure that out. So uh, thank y'all, all of you from wherever you are in the world. Appreciate y'all um, yes, yes. expanding expanding this family, largest Africana studies classroom in the world. Uh, all the folk, it is humbling, but also uh, confirming that this work needs to be done. And that picture, that little baby sitting in front oh. of her face there, and she oh. was enthralled. I was like, you know, I shed a tear because I'm like, this Me is... Too. This is why we do what we do. Because and I'm sorry I had one N word in context because it was Ali talking. But other than that, oh, wow. I, ain't been no, I don't want no children. I don't know. And even the cussing, um, you know, these are words. It's in words. context, that's why we got parents. They're there to you know, that. shepherd them through all yeah. of the words. But we, we, well, the Egyptians say pick the best of words. So I had to make sure. Oh, I should, I, I should mention one. We, 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 I shouldn't have to mention this. Y'all know the autobiography, obviously, of Malcolm X. Um, and I do want to mention this because educators who don't often get perhaps their due. Uh, this was a book that was put together about 25 years ago by a very important sister, good sister, Teresa Perry. Her daughter, you may have heard her daughter's name, Imani Perry. Doctor. Yes, Dr. Imani Perry. That's right. Dr. Teresa Perry. He's an Alabama Negro. He's my homies. She edited a book called Teaching Malcolm X with a lot of curriculum stuff. And you see some of the people who are included on there as well. But it's important to understand that while this is very important work, if, if I was picking one book, oh, and I, and I did mention Lewis Lomax. So I'm just cleaning up a couple of things. This is the new book on Lewis Lomax. Lewis Lomax did a book. Uh, there's a book on him called Life and Times of Lewis Lomax, The Art of Deliberate Disunity. Whatever. Lomax, Lomax was from Columbus, Georgia. He did two books, When the Word is Given and To Kill a Black Man. He knew Malcolm. He debated Malcolm. Lewis Lomax was the black dude that Mike Wallace and them got when they did The Hate That Hate Produced, which is the type of way they show, oh, The Hate That Hate Produced, the black Muslims, back when they put the thing on the CBS affiliate in New York. But here's the thing, Karen, and y'all go to narrative, y'all seen our conversation on Anna Hedgeman. I found a clip of Lewis Lomax sitting asking Anna Arnold Hedgeman what she thought about all these different movements. And then those of you who are in narrative know, Anna Hedgeman, who is the one that got Martin Luther King and A. Philip Randolph together for what became the March on Washington, she was the one who went out when Malcolm X was out there and they were out picking it and got Malcolm to join the picket line in the labor movement. Yeah. So forget all those social structure narratives of who these people are. We have to ask ourselves who we are to each other. And once you do that, 
everything opens up. I just wanted to mention that as final. final uh, yes. The question is what time? Same bad time. Same bad same time. Bad time. Noon Eastern in narrative. We're going to go live and have a discussion. So get, get your questions ready and let's get ready to, to, to build on the pillars that WB Du Bois set forth. Thanks, what? Kareem. You put your website up. Yes, let's do it. Love you. All right, love you too. Oh, wait, your, your class is this the last week of class for you? Last week of class for me. Hey, y'all wish all good energies because teachers at the end of the semester, the hair turns all <laughs> kinds of <laughs> God you, bless you, Professor Hunter. You put all your grades in? My grades are in. Okay. And we are now going to continue to jailbreak the black university. <laughs> <laughs> love you.